Okay, members, you're all very welcome to the meeting of the Justice Committee, and if you can do the needful with any electronic devices, if there's any declarations of interest uh, in respect of business being transacted at this meeting, now is the time to declare it. If not, to proceed. Um, everyone is in attendance, and Sinead Bradley is joining us via the Starleaf facility. Uh, the the main item on the agenda then is in respect of domestic abuse and family proceedings bill and uh, the letter that was received jointly from the Minister of Justice and the Minister for Finance that was dated the 6th of December. Um, both ministers were invited to attend the meeting today to discuss uh, their letter um, requesting that I as chairman consider not moving the committee amendment at the further consideration stage of the domestic abuse and family proceedings bill. Uh, the Minister for Finance uh, has been unavailable to attend this meeting, uh, but the Minister for Justice and the Permanent Secretary, Peter May, is uh, with us. So the relevant papers, members, um, and the, the more recent letter um, from the Minister that was sent uh, last night are on pages 5 to 39 of the meeting pack, and copies of the Department of Justice press release has also been provided um, by members. So can I formally welcome, uh, welcome Naomi Long, Minister of Justice, and Peter May, the Permanent Secretary from the Department of Justice, to the meeting. As normal, this session will be reported by Hansard, and a transcript will be published on the committee page in due course. So, Minister, I'm going to hand over to you to make some opening remarks, and then members, I'm sure, will have some questions. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Chairman, and I um, appreciate the opportunity. I have very few opening remarks to make. I think most of what um, I had to say was included in the correspondence, um, simply to say that I believe that having worked constructively together to ensure this legislation uh, works as well as is possible, I think it would be a huge shame if at this stage we cannot find a way to resolve this last outstanding issue quickly. I think we all share the same determination and the desire to safeguard those who are the victims of domestic abuse and to have the new legislation in place as quickly as possible. Um, it is my intention, and it remains my intention, um, that if we are able, um, through the due diligence that is undertaken on those aspects um, of the legal aid provisions that have been included in the bill um, via amendment, if we can do that due diligence and if there are no repercussive issues that would lead um, to a claim um, from the Northern Ireland Block Grant from other parts of GB, then it would be my intention still to commence those provisions, um, and indeed it would be my legal duty to do so. Um, however, on the understanding that it was not the intention of committee um, that we would end up having such repercussive uh, implications. Um, I was not able to proceed um, yesterday with the bill as I had hoped um, because it had, I had to be reassured um, that the amendment which tied the commencement of the offences to the commencement of the legal aid um, would not go through um, because that would have meant that we could end up in a situation, if these are repercussive, um, that we would then not be in a position to commence the offences. Um, and I think that that would have been a huge loss. So I'm happy um, to answer any questions um, that the committee might have at this stage. But I would want to remind members that we're in a very early stage of trying to understand um, the particular implications of this as it only emerged at the end of last week as an issue um, in discussion with the Department of Finance. Um, and as you rightly note, the Minister of Finance is not available today. Um, and we can't necessarily answer all of the questions um, in relation to finance, but we can certainly answer some of the due diligence that we're trying to do at the moment to resolve the issue. Okay, Minister, thank you. Um, before I bring other members in, and I will do very quickly, it's just some points of clarity um, so that we're all understanding of what the issues is that we're talking about. There was a press release issued last night, um, Minister, under your name. I just want to reference some of the comments in it, because um, it talks about legal aid um, amendments, and it and the very first paragraph references as a result of amendments brought forward by the Justice Committee. It goes on to quote you by saying the proposals made by the Justice Committee were much wider ranging than victims getting access to legal aid. It goes on to say those amendments relating to legal aid provision. What Justice Committee amendments are they? Um, amendment 15. Well, the statement goes on to say a further amendment to be moved by the Committee today would have prevented domestic abuse offences. So, 
final paragraph relates to the further amendments. So what are the previous amendments? It, is the, it was the cumulative effect. The previous amendments were those made by Rachel Woods and Paul Frew and supported by the Justice Committee members um, in the Chamber. So just for clarity, these weren't Justice Committee amendments. you accept that? They were, yes, I do. Okay. Well, the press release is in, inaccurate, so it's useful to have that clarity on the record. It, in the final paragraph, it says that it's imperative that we take time now to ensure whatever legislation is passed does not have unintended consequences. So the press release spoke about taking your time. Then in a, a letter that came in, I think you sent it at 20, uh, 2240 hours, um, that you wanted to move for further consideration stage to be brought in next week, um, and you were going to request the business committee to do that. Yep. Has that been done? That request has been put on a to be confirmed basis and um, based on the decision that will be taken by the committee with respect to Amendment 15. Okay, okay so I'll open up to members now to, to raise some questions. Doug Beatty. Thanks, sir. Does the Vice Chair want to go first? No, no, go ahead, Doug. <coughs> um, uh, thank you, Chair, and, and, and thank you, uh, Naomi Peter, for, for, for coming here. I mean, it's, it, it, it's difficult. There's so much work been put into this um, by everybody concerned, and I think it's really, really important that we get this absolutely right. And, and I'll be honest, I, I'm, I'm not here to debate a press release. I'm not interested in a press release. But what I am interested in is the new information uh, that has been provided, and that new information um, is about the budget, uh, is the Treasury budget guidelines. Uh, which could see a residual cost coming to our block grant um, if we bring in something that's more advantageous here in Northern Ireland than it is uh, in the rest of the United Kingdom. Um, no, we, or, or yourself, Peter, could, could you try and give us a scope of that, please? I mean, I know you're saying you, you haven't got that full scope, but can you give us a, an idea just how large a, 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 an issue that we're talking about here in regards to our fiscal responsibilities? Sure. Well, it is very difficult for us at this stage to estimate figures, so anything we give you now is a very, very rough estimate. Yeah, and even as we have been discussing this since it came to light, those figures have gone up and down considerably during the discussion. But I'm happy to hand over to Peter, who can give you, um, if you like, our latest best guess at what this could be. Um, but bear in mind that it is unpredictable because this is a demand-led service. So whilst we are trying to estimate based on previous demand, we can't anticipate future demand. We also can't, we can't anticipate what the demand might be if this were to be repercussive in terms of uptake um, in GB. So we, there are many unknowns, which is why it is important that we have time to do further due diligence um, and work out the exact cost that this might incur. But there are a range of figures that we're working between, and Peter's happy to set those out. It might help the committee if I just read into the record what is the Treasury Statement of Funding Policy, and it, it's a 2020 policy, and I'm quoting a paragraph 8.4. The, uh, the Dell of the devolved administration will be adjusted downwards to compensate for costs incurred by the UK Government as a result of the actions of a devolved administration, and that is the issue that we need to explore in greater detail. In terms of the, the costings, um, as the minister has said, um, we are at a pretty early, well, we are at a very early stage of trying to work out what this could mean. And I think it's important to say that the, the numbers I'm going to quote are uh, potentially at higher, uh, the highest levels they could be. Um, we will need to see as we go through this as to what it looks like. So we currently um, we know that the current legal aid costs of Article 8 proceedings in the family courts are around eight million pounds per year. Uh, the additional, estimated additional costs of Article 8 proceedings, if Clause 27 currently uh, becomes law, uh, we estimate it up to 14 million a year. That is, uh, a, a, there's, a, there's a range, but that is at the top of the range. The actual costs will depend on a number of factors, including how the provision is implemented and how much additional business the provision generates. We need to do more work, further due diligence, to determine with greater certainty what the real cost will be. There will also be some uh, additional uh, costs of, of Article 8 proceedings um, from uh, if the Minister's Amendment 3 replaces uh, Clause 27 and Amendments 4, 5 and 6 are not carried, um, and we estimate that to be in the region of half a million pounds a year, but again, we'd want to do further due diligence. There are two areas of repercussiveness. Uh, one is, uh, were there to be a view that someone in um, 
the, in Great Britain could seek to rely on what we have done here and to argue, perhaps using human rights grounds, that it was unfair and unreasonable that they were not able to have the same provision uh, in Great Britain. And uh, the repercussiveness there, uh, if you use crude population-based assumptions um, from that 14 million, the figure could be in the region of 400 million pounds a year. But as I said, that's uh, the, the whole area that we need to do more due, due diligence. The second potential area of repercussiveness is within Northern Ireland where other victims might seek to make the same argument that I've just described in uh, Great Britain. So, for example, the victims of a, a sexual crime might seek to make the same arguments about their uh, rights. Um, again, um, we haven't been able to put a figure on that yet, but those are the areas that we need to explore in greater detail. Uh, and would, We've already begun to work on that, but it is going to take us some time to get to a sensible answer. And I think it is one of those areas it's better to get the right answer rather than to get a quick answer. Can I just ask, I mean, that's staggering, and that's staggering figures. Um, uh, can I, when did that come to light? Can I ask, um, I think Friday, which, which but how part? did it come to light? Which part? Well, the part about this, this Treasury sort of guidelines and that repercussiveness, I mean, when, when did it come to light that that was a, that was a case? Because I'll be honest, I, this, that, that, until you said so, I hadn't picked up on it. So. OK, well, there are two elements to it. In terms of the wider issues, in terms of repercussiveness within the Northern Ireland context, so the implications that this could lead to further claims um, from other people who are entitled to legal aid, and the fact that the, quanti the, quant the quantum of cost of this was unknown. Obviously, I made that case in the chamber during the consideration stage and set that out clearly, um, and the Assembly decided to continue um, down this down this route. So that was that was the the, the choice that was made, and, and and we have to facilitate that. The issue about the repercussiveness in terms of GB, um, my understanding is it was raised with officials um, who were in who were engaging with the Department of Finance, and the Department of Finance raised this particular issue about the implications for the block grant of repercussiveness, um, and that was raised late on Thursday evening. It was then worked on throughout Friday. It was brought to my attention on Friday afternoon when I think at that stage um, people realised that yes, there was a particular risk here. Um, and so at that stage, um, we started then to look at what the likely impact of that was going to be in terms of quantum. Um, and that is when we reached a conclusion on the early estimates that it's not something that as a department we could enter into or indeed that the Department of Finance could allow us to enter into um, based on the fact that this could have a catastrophic impact on the block grant as opposed to simply asking the executive to reprioritise um, their funding um, priorities. So at that stage, um, we took a decision that myself and the Department uh, or the Minister of Finance would write to the committee to make you aware of it. Um, and we did that over the weekend um, in order that the committee would be fully aware of the problem that had arisen. And, and am I right then in saying that if this was to go through and that expense was to be realised in a in reasonable worst case scenario, that the, 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 the Minister for Finance, having already given that warning, would not cover the cost? Is that, is that a fair...? It's, it's a cost on the block, I think. I don't think that it necessarily falls to any individual department. Um, My understanding is it is deducted before the block grant is dispersed. So it wouldn't be a matter that the Department of Finance would cover it. It would be that the, we would never receive it. It would be taken as a deduction. I mean, that's if it's fully repercussive. It may not be. It may only be partially repercussive. So these are the things that we can't answer at this stage because we haven't had the opportunity to do due diligence. This may not prove to be repercussive at all, which is the other element of this that I was saying to you yesterday, Doug, um, that this may not be repercussive at all. But we can't say that with any confidence at this stage. And the risk is too high to proceed on the basis that it isn't when it may be. So essentially what we are doing is trying to stop um, the, the risk being carried forward um, by saying that we will do the due diligence. My solution, I guess, to this was that we could continue with the rest of the bill, provided there wasn't, a, provided there wasn't any link between that and starting the offences. We could continue with the commencement of the offences. Um, that wouldn't delay the, the delivery of the main objectives of the bill. Um, the legal aid issue we could then work through in terms of the repercussive issue. If it proves not to be repercussive, then it is our intention that we would commence those um, elements of the bill that relate to legal aid.
um, if the repercussive implications in GB were significant, then we would not be able to commence that. But we would at that stage be able to come to the committee, set out clearly what the implications of that are financially and otherwise, and look towards other mechanisms by which we would be able to move forward that wouldn't have the same repercussive implications to, 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 in order to obtain the objective of the, the Assembly. No, and, 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 and I get that. So if, if you had the time... When would you be able to, 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 to find out uh, and do that due diligence and, and realise whether it's going to be repercussive throughout the whole of the UK or not? How long will that take? Well, we are currently, um, we are currently drafting um, instructions for senior counsel to look at this. Um, we will hopefully be able to get legal counsel advice um, back um, what we would hope this side of Christmas. We will then need to take time to consider that along with the Department of Finance. Um, however, we would also then need to look um, at some other issues and maybe Peter, if you want to just come in because we also then need to look at what the implications. Remember that these build on each other. So for example, if we find that this could be repercussive um, in terms of um, sexual offences here or other c classes of victim here, then that would also potentially be have further repercussions in terms of the block grant. So we need to clarify all of this, and it's not easy for me to say how long that will take, which is part of the problem. But obviously we're working on it now, which is how the due diligence through this particular issue up. Yeah, and, and, and I guess if I can just finish, um, Chair, thank you. And I guess ju just to, th to throw back, and, and what is a real concern for me, and I guess for other people, is is as it stands in IOSIS, you know, um, in the commencements, you know, provisions as a Department of Justice consider appropriate, and, and I guess there's just that real concern, um, uh, Minister, that, that this will be knocked on and knocked on and knocked on. Well, I, I mean, I guess. Well, there are two things I will say in terms of that, Doug. I mean, first of all, and, and Peter can come in on this, there is a legal ruling from the House of Lords um, dating back to the 1990s, which makes it clear that a minister is not at liberty simply not to commence um, parts of a bill. Um, without good reason, and good reason would be not would not be something that I just didn't like. So to be clear about that, there is a legal obligation. But more than that, this comes down to trust and integrity. I mean, I have given you my word in the committee um, that if this is not repercussive in terms of GB, uh, we will go ahead and take the will of the assembly on board. That is my duty as a member of the executive and as a member of the assembly. I may disagree with how this came about. But that is neither here nor there. Consideration stage has passed. A decision has been made by the Assembly that this is how people want to proceed. And therefore, it is my duty to implement that. And the question here is, if you want to tie my hands because you don't trust me, then I think we have much bigger issues than just the repercussive nature of this particular um, amendment. It might help the committee, just in case anyone wishes to go into the detail, um, to quote the legal um, precedent here. So, as uh, the Minister said it's a UK House of Lords case from 1995, R versus Secretary of State for the Home Department, ex parte Fire Brigades Union, and it found that there was a duty to keep under review the question of implementation. So it's not, and that's something then that obviously the committee could at any point ask uh, the Minister uh, in order to explore how she is uh, fulfilling that duty. So uh, just to be clear. And if I could just finish it, just, not a question, but I could just finish it and, and just be absolutely clear for me on a personal uh, note, uh, this is not an issue of trust with me. I, I, I trust the Minister and I absolutely trust your staff, absolutely trust the Minister and the staff. So I have no issue in regards to staff. I think uh, I trust, I think you work uh, incredibly hard. For me, it's about making sure I have all of the information. Sure. And this is new information for me today to take in. We, no. Which only came out on Friday. I appreciate that, and it has been. I mean, it has been new information. I think to us all, um, and rocked us all back in our heels somewhat um, on Friday. I mean, we were doing due diligence with re with respect to trying to estimate how much this is likely to cost, um, so that we could be prepared um, in terms of bidding in the executive processes. We were not doing it with a view to expecting that there was going to be a major issue, um, and so it has thrown us all, I think, slightly backwards. But I mean, what I want to focus on is actually getting this legislation legislation implemented, getting the offences on the books and getting a legal aid solution which we can
can bring forward safely and without um, having undue impact um, on the executive's budget. I believe that that is possible um, if we can deal with the repercussive issue. Um, and I, you know, as I say, we have not ruled out yet that this may not prove to be repercussive, in which case um, we will be able to proceed. And it would be our intention, as we said in the letter from myself and the Minister of Finance, it would be our intention to commence these proceedings at the same time um, as the offences. Um, provided that that repercussive issue has been addressed um, to everyone's satisfaction and that we're confident that it won't be repercussive. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Minister and Prime Secretary, for attending here today in what is a, uh, an emergency meeting. Uh, and I think it was needed uh, in regards to the not moving the bell yesterday uh, to disappoint a lot of people, but I think everyone recognises that we need good, sound, secure law. So that's not the issue. A point of correction, and for the record, Minister, um, my, amend my amendments with Rachel was on clause nine. Apologies. Uh, not on clause twenty-seven. Uh, the credit uh, is rightly all on Rachel, not on me. Um, <laughs> in that regard, uh, can I ask, Minister? So it seems like a long time ago you were praising her highly in the chamber yes, now, yes. Paul. <laughs> uh, can, I, can I just ask? Uh, you talk about your liaison with the Department of Finance and the Minister. What questions did the Finance Minister pose to you? The Finance Minister didn't pose questions to me. It was my officials who were liaising with officials in the Department of Finance, and they raised this particular issue around repercussiveness, and they asked what due diligence we had done to ensure that that was not an issue. And then we started to look at that particular element, because it was not something that we had anticipated. Um, and so we went back and started to look, and that is when it came to light. So and Peter can perhaps set out more of what happened with the officials, but my understanding certainly is that it was in those discussions, that the, the official-to-official -official discussions that were happening, um, and it wasn't from the, from the Minister of Finance to me. The engagement that I have had with the Minister of Finance has been through the Executive Committee, um, where I have raised um, concerns about the, the cost of this and how it would be budgeted for. Um, and made my point to executive members that obviously it would require additional funding to be set aside for the Department of Justice in order to cover le legal aid bills in the future um, to allow for that. Um, but it was when officials were actually doing due diligence um, around some of these issues that this was, this was raised with them. So you, you, one of your letters to us states these arose following questions from DOF on yes. the legal and aid costs in other jurisdictions and other parts of the legal aid scheme in Northern Ireland. Yes. Uh, so, that is correct. It was so, the Department of Finance, not the Minister of Finance. So, so there will be a record there of those questions posed. So my question, Minister, is can this, depart, this committee see, have sight of those questions and any minutes uh, or correspondence between your department and the Department of Finance? Well, Peter, it's a matter really of... Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that... Um, I, I, it's, there are some quite simple questions that were posed to us in an email, so let, let me take that away. And I don't see any reason why they wouldn't be that wouldn't be shared with the uh, the committee. Um, and that, that would be all correspondence. Well, the correspondence essentially, the, the, as the minister has explained, she had written to the executive on a couple of occasions before consideration, further consideration stage. That was the only correspondence that came back. Okay, uh, but, but with all regards to officials meeting and congregating and discussing, a minute would be kept of those interactions? Um, there hasn't been um, lots of congregating and meeting as you describe it, so um, what we got was some questions in an email uh, from finance to our um, head of finance, um, so, so that's, that there aren't any minutes of meetings because there haven't been any meetings about this. Uh, with regards to even Zoom calls or phone Calls are they recorded or kept minutes? You wouldn't. You, you certainly wouldn't be keeping minutes of every phone conversation you had with any uh, a colleague within government. Otherwise, you'd never do anything else other than write write notes of minutes or diary notes or anything like that. Um, you wouldn't. There's no compulsion to keep any said such uh, notes. Uh, Minister, you talk about your due diligence, which you have started or commenced. Your department started and commenced, and you told answer to Doug that you, you expect the advice uh, within weeks probably before this new year uh, and then you would have to consider that advice. How long are you leaving um, for that advice to be looked at and, and uh, 
to be, to be clear, it was legal counsel I was speaking yeah. about, not um, the due diligence. The due diligence work would have to continue within the department on a whole range of issues arising from these amendments. But we have we are instructing legal counsel at the moment, um, and those instructions are being drafted. We would be hopeful that we will be able to get a response from legal counsel um, before Christmas. Um, and then we would need to take time to consider that. It's unlikely to be a straightforward answer, a yes or no. Um, it's likely to be complex, as most legal advice is, and heavily caveated. Um, and therefore, we will have to take time to consider that and also to consider it along with other colleagues um, because of the cross-cutting implications um, of what we're dealing with. So I can't give you um, a direct time in terms of completion of the due diligence, um, and I can't give you a, a confident time in, in terms of what it might require um, in terms of further discussion with executive colleagues either at this stage because I haven't got sight of the legal advice. With regards to, and you, you, you state in your letters about the issue about the differential between our jurisdiction and England, you cite, uh, are you saying that there's no differences between the legal aid set up in this jurisdiction compared to England? And if there are differences, how are we not concerned and worried about the repercussions of those differentials? Well, the first thing to say is there are differences because our legal aid system is considerably more generous um, than the legal aid system in England and Wales. And so for that reason, um, there are differences. Um, there is already a case uh, referred to in the letter that has been taken, I think, on human rights grounds. Peter, if you, is that correct, I think? It's been taken, I think, on those grounds um, seeking equality of treatment, essentially. Uh, we can't judge as to whether or not that case will be successful or not, um, but it may have implications for us down the line. Um, with respect to... Um, so I think, to be clear, that is a case being taken by someone in Northern Ireland, yeah. arguing that the provision in GB is more um, attractive or more beneficial... In their circumstances. In their circumstances, and arguing that on human rights grounds that is discriminatory. So that is a case that we are defending at the moment. How many cases like that have you fought in the past? I don't know the answer to that question. And uh, I, by all means, can go and see whether we can find that out. Uh, I don't know how easy it will be to find that out, but I'll try to. Would it be zero? I don't know is the answer to that. The, the more fundamental point, um, Paul, is that it is a tangible risk. And therefore, in order to do due diligence, we would have to assess that risk. Um, and we would have to look at what the implications were if this was to materialise. Um, we can't operate on the basis that no one has noticed to date and therefore no one has taken a case. Um, were that to be actually proven to be the case, that would not be a sound basis on which to make decisions. And the other issue I think that you were asking was on what basis can we have different legal aid arrangements. Um, and I think that a lot of that, first of all, will rest on a degree of... <laughs> a degree of expectation that the courts would accept the principles around devolution, although that is being tested increasingly, um, as you will be aware. Um, and there is the other aspect of this, that normally were we to be making changes to legal aid, we would be doing that after a policy development process so that you would have a defence position, for example, that in the round the legal aid system uh, was comparable, if not the same. Um, but we don't have that defence because these are unique and, uh, and individual changes. Um, so it's not a comprehensive package of measures that would bring, if you like, balance. It's a specific measure that we're making. And therefore, my concern on this uh, would be that we may be more exposed in that regard. But that's something that, again, we would need to take legal advice on to be sure about the implications of it. But you're right to say there is a difference between the legal aid system here and the legal aid system in England and Wales. Um, and that has been consistently the case. We have reviewed, as you know, the legal aid system. Um, we have reduced the amount of spend on legal aid considerably. Um, but nevertheless, it is still more generous um, in most regards um, than the system in England and Wales, though I have to say it is also quite different, so direct comparators are very difficult. Indeed. So if, if, for instance, someone, and we'll not talk about a particular case, because we understand that the pitfalls there, but if someone was to take a case here in Northern Ireland against a more generous system in England, are you saying that you would expect a Barnet consequential change in a positive sense? So I think you have to look at the individual circumstances of whatever the case is and on what grounds it is found if were we to lose such a case. Um, but the logic of repercussiveness is that it can apply either way. Um, I think the, the point the Minister has made is until we see the legal advice, 
we won't know the extent to which they, they may be very definitive one way or another, or they may say there are some issues in the middle here that need to be explored further, and we just don't know what that, that legal advice is going to say at this stage. Your Amendment 3, Minister, have you costed that and also assessed that for impact on repercussions? Well, it will affect all of the legal aid provisions, the, the repercussiveness. I mean, this is, this is going to affect all of the legal aid provisions. In terms of the amendment that we have brought forward um, to, um, uh, to, I think it's now Clause 27, it was Amendment 27 before, um, I, I think that the purpose of that um, is to ensure, for example, that only respondents would be affected. That significantly reduces the potential cost of the legal aid measure and therefore also reduces the consequences of the repercussiveness. Um, so, I mean, all, all of this will obviously depend on what the final outcome is in terms of the overall cost um, of the legal aid provision. So, um, at the moment, it's an expansive provision, and therefore the, the implications are significant. Um, if we were, for example, to reduce um, the extent of the provision and restrict the, the provision and make it narrower, then that may make the repercussive implications of it much smaller. And it may be then that the balance, if you like, in terms of how, how big an issue it would be, would be very different. So it really depends, I think, on the degree to, of expenditure that we would, we, we would foresee this actually um, amounting to. And I think that that's what we would need to get reassurance about. But also we can only do that once we know whether or not this is going to be repercussive, because that starts a different conversation um, where this essentially becomes a finance issue because they're obviously responsible for the block grant and what happens to the block grant, not the Department of Justice. So, so if Clause 27, as it presently sits in the face of bill, costs, I think you said, £14 million top of rate, top of the range for Northern Ireland Impact, and I think a half a million a year for other costs associated uh, with your no. much so res restricted clause, or amendment, sorry, you, how much difference would that be? So that was the half million figure. That's the the outer limit in cost terms is, is is anticipated to be half a million a year. But again, further due diligence would be needed. That's on the basis that Amendment Three replaces Clause Twenty Seven, and Amendments Four, Five, and Six are not carried. So we go from fourteen million top range to half a million top yeah. range a year. Yes. According to the two different amendment, the Clause Twenty Seven as it sits, yes. and then your amendment. Yeah. But the repercussionness, uh, repercussiveness. Uh, if so, 27 sets could be upwards of 400 million a year. So repercussion is actually, I mean, we gave you an, a, a very broad bush figure. It's fair to say, um, you know, we don't have high levels of confidence about the numbers that we're offering today, but we feel if we don't offer any numbers, then that is also open to misinterpretation. Um, actually, repercussion is actually determined by how much additional cost is incurred in the other jurisdiction. So there is no slide rule judgment that actually determines that in advance. Um, so, so just to be clear about that, we've used a population kind of equivalence as a means of trying to make a, a stab at what, at what that would look like. Um, I suppose what I'm getting at is your amendment three. Yes. There is re repercussiveness in that in itself because that's not aligned to English legal aid mechanisms. All, as, as the minister said, all of these all of these issues could have some repercussiveness, although the quantities are much smaller. Minister, can I ask if 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 you hadn't if 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 this hadn't occurred, if say somebody in the Department of Finance hadn't raised this with your department, uh, and the bill would have went through as it is now, or even with your amendment to Clause 27, when were you seriously considering commencing Clause 27? It would have been our intention to do the due diligence and then commence Clause 27. And have you no calendar date uh, or aspect of when that would take? No. You were able to give us a uh, forecast at a time where you would commence the bill a year after Royal Assent uh, at a time. Are we talking about that type of Well, as we said in the correspondence, that year would have given us time to do some of this due diligence and to make sure that there were no issues. But whatever issues then would have been thrown up, we would have to deal with, which is what is happening actually now in advance of the bill um, finalising this passage. But again, as we said in the correspondence that we've sent to committee, it was our intention to commence the two at the same time. Um, the issue here has arisen because if there is an issue around repercussiveness, um, which would preclude us from being able to commence um, the clause as set down, then we would not be able 
um, with Amendment 15 in place to be able to commence any of the um, domestic abuse offence provisions, and that would mean that the bill essentially wasn't doing anything. Um, so that would cause real difficulties. We would then need to find a further vehicle in order to make corrections to the bill, and so on and so forth. So. Um, that, that's, that's, the, that's the fundamental issue. So the intention is that if these repercussive costs are out and risks of repercussion are minor um, and are not deemed to be significant when we get legal advice, um, and if the quantum of finance that it would affect is, is deemed to be small, then we would then hope to be in, a, in the position that we had originally stated, which is to commence both at the same time. I, I don't know the mind of this committee. We'll know, maybe know later on, but uh, the committee, the minds of the committee were very sure last week, and that's why we put down the commencement amendment. Uh, you, you surely realise that by not moving the bill yesterday and and getting us on the floor of the assembly, and again it was your, it was absolutely your right not to move the bill. But you do realise that even if this committee doesn't move an amendment like that, any single member. MLA can move the exact same amendment. So what you could face now is a two-week delay, three-week delay, and yet still have to address an amendment of that type. Well, the first thing to say is that if the committee withdraws its amendment, um, and it, it is within the committee's right to do that, um, the committee would withdraw the amendment, another member would have to table that amendment, and we would need to take consideration if another member chose to do that. The other thing is to say that I, on the basis that I would be willing to accept the reassurances um, of members of the committee, would accept that if members of the committee said that they were not going to vote for it and that their parties were not going to vote for it, that I would continue on um, on the basis of trust that we would be able to, we would be able to take this forward. Um, but what I could not do um, was in in the case that you suggest um, was to proceed yesterday at considerable risk um, without any such reassurance. Um, had I thought that perhaps the chairman was only going to move um, the amendment, but that other members, um, because he would have had to do so unless he met as a part of the committee beforehand, um, but that other members were not going to support it and that other parties were not going to support it, then I would have been able to proceed yesterday. I did not have those reassurances. Um, and therefore, I had no choice yesterday. Um, because the risk would have been, had I gone to the floor of the chamber, without all of the figures, without all of the information, that the questions that are only being answered today would not have been answered to people's satisfaction yesterday, because we're still working through it. The people would have not taken us at our word, um, because there seems to be a distinct lack of trust in terms of what we're trying to achieve here. And therefore, we would not have been able um, to convince members on the floor of the House that this would cause a difficulty with the bill. And for that reason, I did not want to jeopardise the offences being taken forward, because I recognise that there are people out there who want to see these offences in place. I want to see these offences in place. It was my priority when I came into office. The committee wants to see these offences in place. But I could not take the risk um, that by not being able to deal with this issue yesterday on the floor of the House, that we could end up either having a catastrophic impact on the block grant on one hand, um, or not being able to commence any of the offences. I mean, that is, that is Hobson's choice. There's no good outcome from that. So the better outcome was to pause, albeit that it was very difficult to do, and I was not happy at all at having to do it. But the only option that was available to me was to pause yesterday um, to ensure that we could have this conversation and that members would be fully informed of the consequences of passing such an amendment and the implications that it has for the bill. You talk about consequences for a bill and a piece of legislation, Minister, and you say that having just moved health regulations that have no impact assessment completed. I mean, I'm not sure I follow your, your point. Well, you've just moved legislation in this House, which is quite draconian, with no impact assessment whatsoever, but yet you will not afford democratic accountability and process to take place on this bill? Well, the process for the health regulations, which I have to say, Chairman, is well off beam in terms of the conversation that we're having as a member of this committee, because I'm not responsible for the scrutiny of the health regulations or for drafting them. But the process for approving those regulations was agreed by the Assembly, and therefore the Assembly had the opportunity to say that they were not happy with the mechanism for agreeing the health regulations. The Assembly agreed the mechanism for the health regulations, and I'm bringing that forward today on behalf of the Health Minister and the Executive Office. Um, I'm simply assisting them with their work 
Um, but it was not me who prescribed the process. The Assembly chose the process. And so I think that the point that you make, uh, whilst I understand people's concerns about the process, um, I think they're not really properly directed at me. We, uh, we, uh, I look forward to seeing all the correspondence between the Department of Finance and yourselves. Thank you, Chair. Just before I bring Sinead Bradley in, just for clarity then, when the Department put down the Amendment 3, it hadn't carried out the due diligence on that and identified the cost of potential that only emerged on Thursday of last week. Well, as you're aware, that, yeah, that's correct, because as you're aware, the purpose and the outworking of Amendment 3 would be to restrict um, Clause 27, and therefore any such implications or um, repercussions would be less than with uh, Clause 27 standing unamended. Sinead Bradley. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Chair, for um, convening the meeting. It is appreciated, and I want to thank the Minister and Permanent Secretary for being here, because it is a tight window of opportunity to try and arm ourselves with as many facts as possible. And I do have to say, um, I know having had conversations with the Minister and Permanent Secretary, it is reassuring to hear the opening remarks where the Minister further states on the record her assurances that it is her intention um, to commence with these regulations of this um, piece of the bill. Obviously, she has received a red flag warning, I suppose, from the Department of Finance at the 11th hour. And she will have a duty to um, to explore that and understand the significance of it, as do we as individual members and the committee also have that duty um, to, to make sure that, because ultimately there is an irony here, if the scale of the problem is as suggested, we could end up with a reduction in the block grant, which ironically then would no doubt uh, be spread across all departments and the bill, as we intended, could suffer um, because there may not be resource within the department to, to lean into those other things that we talked about, the training and the actual um, delivery of this bill. So that said, um, I do take some comfort in the Minister reaffirming that position of the intention to commence. But I am trying, and, I, and I'm not going to speak to the trust issue because I don't think it is about that. I think it's fair for us to ask questions to understand it. And that that's not um, to say we don't trust anybody. That is to say we want to understand better uh, what is being presented to us. So I tried to retrace this and I, I understand it arrived on a Friday afternoon and that and that is unfortunate in terms of the timing because I think everybody um, had a very common shared objective about getting this bill across the line. And a lot of, I think we were buoyed up and we were um, certainly determined to see it happen. So it's disappointing for any of us when there's an obstacle put up. But I'm looking back right from walking through from the outset. So at the outset of this bill, am I right to say that we did have to satisfy ourselves that it was a devolved matter and it was in the competence of the Assembly. And also I think it was put down that it was cost neutral. Well now I'm reflection, I'm wondering, was it any of those things? Because surely this issue of repercussive um effect could almost apply to anything that is a devolved matter if there is um, a deviation then from other parts of the UK. And then that that puts a question mark around devolved matter. And I don't think we even have time to get into all of that. Um, but I just think it's something worth flagging up because ultimately this could reappear at any committee at any time on any bill. Um, if that principle isn't fully bottomed out and we understand the better, the better of it. Um, what I would ask then, um, looking at it, you know, we, we need to get down, and I understand everything the Minister saying, the, the red flag has been raised, and um, so we can't unsee or unhear that, and nor should we. And I absolutely agree with the Minister when she says at the outset, we, we are determined to get this offence on the statute books without delay. You know, nobody, nobody wants to see that delay, but that does not um, deviate or d diminish in any way the importance of the legal aid effect on those victims. And that's a significant part of it. So I just want to put it, just we're absolutely clear, if the committee didn't take a position to decouple the commencement of uh, Clause 27 to the actual, the rest of the bill, 
what is the minister's intention in that, cir- in that set of circumstances? And also that could, um, as Paul Freer alluded to, even if the committee did take a position and another individual member arrived um, with that, again, presented it as an amendment, what, what is the minister's intention under those circumstances? Well, I mean, first of all, um, I'll answer your last question first, if I may. Um, if Amendment 15 stands part of the bill, we will still have to do the due diligence work required in order to understand and mitigate the risks associated with the legal aid provisions. If, as a result of that work, it is clear that the risk of commencing the provisions is too great, then we cannot responsibly commence them. So Amendment 15 would then stop us commencing um, the other provisions, including those provisions that relate to the creation of domestic abuse offences. It's not an outcome we want or that we would expect. Um, We would hope that is not the case, but it is a real possibility. And so I have to let the committee know that because it would have an impact on us all. And most of all, um, it would have an impact on victims. I mean, I can give you the commitment again um, and be absolutely clear. I will commence Clause 27 on completion of the necessary due diligence work, provided it is safe to do so, and I will report to committee on that work as it progresses. So Amendment 15 is not needed in order to force me to do so, um, because I am not resisting um, the decision that has been taken by the Assembly, and I am going to implement that. With respect to the wider issue um, of Um, whether things could be repercussive and how could we then have any devolution. Clearly, the point of devolution is that we can have different positions on issues in different jurisdictions, and that is the case across a number of different areas, including health um, and the economy um, and education. What can occur, however, in these circumstances is that any person can make an argument to a court that they, on human rights, equality or other grounds, should be entitled to a more favourable treatment that is available elsewhere. This is a particular risk when it comes to legal aid provision because it deals directly with access to justice issues and the exercise of fundamental rights and because it is heavily contested and litigated. So the issue of repercussive cost is routinely examined in the course of any economic appraisal of policy and legislative proposals so that risks can be fully identified and properly understood and mitigated where possible. The difficulty here is, because of the way this um, clause came about, that there has been no opportunity to do that work, um, which I referred to during the consideration stage. And so we're left with a large, unquantified and uncontrolled financial exposure, and we need to take the time to put that right. The Statement of Funding Policy sets out how the UK Government, and Peter has read that um, out this, this afternoon, um, funding for the devolved administrations is determined and notes that the budget of the devolved administration will be adjusted downwards um, to compensate for costs incurred by the UK government as a result of the actions of a devolved administration. There is no easy way for us to identify exactly what those costs would be because it will depend on demand. It is a demand-led service. Um, however, it could be significant and that is what we have been able to determine and that is why um, we were unable to proceed because the consequences, um, as I have already set out in my earlier answer, are that we would not be able to proceed with any of the elements of the Bill um, on the basis of Amendment 15 being passed. And As I have said, I am willing to take members at their word if parties are willing to um, co- commit to not passing Amendment 15 and to voting against it, then I am willing to take members at their word on that and proceed um, if another member does decide to put down such uh, an amendment. Of course, then I would expect the support of the committee and their parties um, to resist it, because I think it is important that we decouple those two issues to allow us um, to deal with the legal aid. But I reiterate the point that I made in my letter um, and in conversations with you um, during this evidence session today. It is my intention to commence um, Clause 27. That is my intention. It is my intention to do it at the same time as we commence the offences. So this is not something that we want to delay, but we have to do it only on the basis that it is safe to do so um, and doesn't expose the department um, to this level of risk. And that is what we need to be able to do, and I was unable to do yesterday. Thank you, Minister. Um, so that's fairly comprehensive. So so um, you, you would go ahead and table the bill regardless of the outcome of committee. I think I'm taken from that. Um, based on that then, um, Minister, the... No, 
What I'm actually saying is that I'm willing to table and I've asked for the, the bill to be brought back. Um, we had a slot held for final um, reading um, next week. I've asked um, the business committee um, to hold that slot for further consideration, but that is to be confirmed um, as a result of the discussions that I have with the committee. And should the committee still be minded to push Amendment 14, um, then I will confirm with them that I don't intend to take it forward next week. Um, if Amendment 14 or 15 is not supported by the committee, and if I have the reassurances that that amendment will not be supported by the various parties, um, then I will be able to continue um, with further consideration stage. I was unable to get that yesterday. I would have been willing to operate on the basis of such reassurance yesterday um, so that we could continue with the bill, but we were unable to do that, and I accept that it was very short notice, um, as it was to me when it was raised um, at the weekend. But nevertheless, um, I am willing to continue on that basis um, going forward. Um, but if that isn't agreed, then I will not be able to proceed until the due diligence is done, because Amendment 15 would then require us not um, to be able to proceed with any part of the bill um, and would leave us in a very, um, a, basically in a, a, an intractable situation where we couldn't actually commence um, any of the provisions of the bill. Okay. Appreciate that, and that's just how. Yes, yeah, so so the department would it basically wouldn't proceed, and the department would take on the role of doing the due diligence anyway while the bill sits there not proceeding. And uh, okay, um, so so basically then on that, um, in terms of the due diligence piece and the piece where you as a department and the officials you need to satisfy yourself that there would be no repercussive effect, and also that sort of economic appraisal about the further costs of um, any legal aid proposal. What what parameters would you set, you know, to say we're safe to go or no, this this is problematic um, for the department? I know the repercussive part in terms of the GB is clearer um, because it either is or it's not. And but in terms of then the legal aid piece, um, measuring that out, at what point would would the department say, right, we've considered this and we're good to go, you know, we're, we're going to go ahead. We have no measure there. I don't understand exactly um, at what point you would say this is not safe to proceed or this is safe to proceed. Okay. Um, Sorry, there are two separate points to the question. The first yeah. is about the implications in Northern Ireland and the second is about the implications in GB and <laughs> Peter can keep me right on this. With respect to repercussions in GB, it is my understanding um, and certainly it was my perspective that it was not the intention of the uh, Assembly um, to reduce the block grant um, in order to fund any kind of legal aid claim from England and Wales. And therefore, I don't believe that the Assembly's intent in voting for um, Clause 27 to be part of the bill um, was um, w was with that intent. And therefore, yesterday, I felt that it, we had to stop in order to clarify the position. Um, when it comes to the issue of legal aid in Northern Ireland, you already know my view on that um, and how that should have been handled. Um, but the, uh, the Assembly has made a decision um, and will make further decisions in regard to that. Um, I will give my advice and my guidance, as always, um, and set out the alternative propositions. Um, however, if the Assembly, in, um, in its wisdom, decides to continue uh, with larger expenses and repercussive costs and so on, that is a decision which I believe the Assembly has taken with intent. So uh, that is a different matter, I think, to the repercussive costs um, in Northern Ireland. We have explained the issue already about the knock-on effects for other victims. We have made all members aware of the risk of that. We have made members aware um, of the potential challenges around legal aid more generally um, because of this, but the Assembly decided to proceed. So I don't think it would be appropriate for me to set a limit um, on what would be done, but I would expect, obviously, um, members who have supported it um, to also support the bid from the department for any additional finances that we might need to cover the costs of it. Um, but I think that that is separate and distinct from the issue of repercussiveness um, in terms of GB. So maybe if that clarifies that I wouldn't be saying that I wouldn't um, commence 
uh, 27 if it was simply to do with the cost um, to the Northern Ireland Block Grant in terms of what the departmental budget impact would be, um, but if it was to do with the Block Grant in terms of us potentially losing um, significant amounts from the Block Grant um, as a result of repercussiveness in the UK, then I think that that's a different matter altogether, and I don't think it would reflect the intent um, of those who voted um, at consideration and indeed in future further consideration stages. Thank you, Minister. And just two further points, Chair, if I might. Um, the, the, the issue around the timeline, and I know Doug uh, Beatty tried to reference it there, in terms of 27A comes into effect, I think it's a two-year provision there um, around that. So 27A will pick up on a lot of what 27, Clause 27, is trying to achieve. And I'm trying to, to work out, Minister, you mentioned about having some um, council before Christmas, but has that changed? Because in the conversations we had, it was likely that you wouldn't be able to get that until into the new year. So just to know if that's changed and it's a change for the better if it's yep. the case, but I'd just like to understand it. And also, um, just on a final point, do you, Minister, um, or the Department, intend, because obviously amendments are open at the moment, um, do you intend to submit any further amendments to the bill at all, and in particular around this issue on 27 or, um, or anything on the commencement piece? Thank you. Um, in respect, first of all, of the timing um, of council, um, the advice that I had yesterday when I spoke to you was that we wouldn't have that advice available until after Christmas. Um, we then took um, we had further discussions this morning, and I was advised that we could get the advice potentially before Christmas. Um, we're currently drafting the instructions for council, um, but that we would need further time um, after that in order to be able um, to assess the legal advice. I mean, this is unlikely. I have to say to be a one-word answer, yes or no. It's likely to be a complex issue and involve a way a way up um, of the various um, aspects of this and looking at other legal precedents, so it's unlikely to be straightforward, um, and therefore um, we we will need some time to reflect on that um, and also to consider it with with colleagues in the Department of Finance. With respect to further amendments, it's not my intention at this stage to bring further amendments to the bill. Um, the amendments that I had put um, from the department and had briefed the committee on are, are as far as I intend to go, um, and I wasn't intended to bring anything further. Um, I, would, I, I don't see that there's much purpose at this stage of trying to further change um, elements of the bill. Um, I think further consideration stage should really be a tidying up exercise, and so we've done that um, already with yourselves um, and discussed through what the implications of those amendments would be. So it's certainly not my intention at this stage. However, obviously, if something massive again arises, um, we would have to look at that, but it's not my intention, certainly not. And the fact that I've said, um, <coughs> pardon me, um, the fact that I've held um, some space um, in the Assembly next week for further consideration stage means actually that the effective time for amendments will close very quickly anyway, so it's unlikely um, that anything would emerge in the interim. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Sinead. Um, Rachel. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Minister and Permanent Secretary, for being here today um, and for Paul clarifying earlier on in terms of the amendment and why we're here today. Um, so, there's a couple of points just that was mentioned there um, about the court case. Whereabouts is that in the court system? It's at the High Court. And is that um, has it been accepted? Has it been granted leave? Right. Is it where is right. it about to be judged on or, or, or judgment issued? I don't have to be sad. It wouldn't really be appropriate either for us to call to discuss it, to be honest, Rachel, given that it, we're respondents in that case. And I appreciate that. Just if we're what I'm trying to sort of get to is that if we are waiting for finding out what potential repercussiveness quantities, um, is it the is it Someone, is it the legal advice that's being sought by the department, yeah, or is it the outcome of a court case? It's, it's, it's not the outcome of the court case. We, um, we we would hope that legal advice and further due diligence within the department would be able to take us uh, down down the path. Clearly, you always adjust your view depending on what the latest legal cases determine, but you wouldn't hold off reaching a view for that purpose. Okay. It's also worth bearing in mind that, as we said, it is a similar point of law, but not the same point of law. So it wouldn't necessarily have direct read across. 
And just in terms of that similar point of law, is it to do with a domestic abuse case or is it to do with a legal aid waiver? It's, 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 a, it's a legal aid case. Um, it's around a statutory charge. That's all the information I have at the moment. Um, so it, it's broadly analogous rather than the same point. Okay. Thank you. Um, Peter, you had mentioned potential victims of sexual crime as, um, as, as an example of potential... Of, possible court cases or future judicial action. Could you elaborate on a wee bit more on this, please? It's kind of new information. It wasn't in any of the letters that were sent to the committee um, about the potential for, for different types of victims. I was just drawing out that um, you know, within Northern Ireland, there could be other cases brought by uh, individuals who are not subject to domestic abuse, but have been subject to uh, to, to other off uh, offending, and uh, they could seek to uh, make a case based on human rights or equality grounds that they should be entitled to the same provisions. The Minister, I think, has already rehearsed the fact that, in her view, the Assembly has spoken on that, and that is a decision they've uh, consciously taken. Um, so that isn't going to be material grounds for uh, the way in which the Department or the Minister approach um, the taking forward of this legislation but I was just drawing it out again. I think it has been drawn out at previous stages of the bill in terms of a relevant consideration. It's part of the um, response, I suppose, Rachel, that I gave um, when it came to um, the issue of why I felt this would be better um, dealt with through, for example, regulations that we could then tailor and respond rapidly, um, because obviously one of the issues would be that if there were repercussive um, implications for other victims um, and if it was, an, it was a kind of open-ended and uncosted provision and um, that that could have implications. I, I think that at each stage where we um, where we place more restrictions around um, the, the particular uh, measures, then the less repercussive it's likely to become, um, because obviously you're constraining the number of people who might be able to argue that they have a similar um, entitlement. Um, but that was really the point that I was making, that normally we would do a business case, we would look at the financial appraisal of this, um, and we would then know whether or not there were other categories of um, of respondent who may feel that they would be unfairly um, disadvantaged if they were not able to access the same provisions. Um, and we don't know the extent to which that would be the case. But I think that members um, were aware of that. I certainly raised uh, the issue um, in terms of the discussions um, about the unknown implications of this. So I can only presume that members were content to proceed on that basis um, at consideration stage, and therefore that wouldn't preclude us moving forward. Thank you, Minister. So in terms of being unfairly disadvantaged, has there been cases taken yet on the waiver that already exists for normal station orders and for forced marriage waivers? I don't know the answer to that. The issue, of course, again, is not whether or not people have taken cases. Because whilst that um, may indicate whether or not people have currently taken cases, it doesn't mitigate the risk of people in future taking cases. And therefore, I think that there is a significant, um, in terms of mitigating risk, I mean, there are lots of things that haven't happened yet that could happen and one has to prepare for. Um, my house is never flooded, but I still take out flood insurance. I, I appreciate that. Um, we would never legislate on anything um, for things that could happen. Um, then if we're going for this, but I'm, I'm looking at it through a mindset of victims. Well, of no, with respect, that is not the case. We're not saying that we would never legislate on anything because that might happen. What we're saying is that before we would legislate on something that is complex and has potential um, for repercussive implications, that we would do due diligence, that we would do a proper economic appraisal, that we would engage with the Department of Finance and other ministers in respect of how this might impact on, on their work um, and on that. And I mean, I could draw a parallel for example, with the decision taken today um, by the Minister of Health um, in relation to payment of sick pay or of, um, of pay to those members who were on strike during the health strike. Um, and before that was able to be brought forward, even though it was the intention of the executive to do so, before that was able to be brought forward, there was a, 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 a lot of due diligence, a lot of legal opinion had to be sought. Um, and a lot of advice had to be taken in order to ensure before that was done that there were no repercussive implications. So it's not as simple as simply deciding that something is a good thing to do, because we all accept that these are good things to do. 
um, it is about being certain before we do them of the implications of them in terms of the budget and in terms of the finances, and being confident um, that the that the implicate that it doesn't have unintended consequences, and that's something that we haven't as yet been able to do in respect of this particular amendment, and that's why we would need um, to be able to do that. However, as I've already stated, it isn't about this particular amendment because that has been passed. Um, and it will be a matter for um, the Assembly to decide whether or not they amend it further um, at further consideration stage. The key question here is whether we couple the commencement of legal aid um, to the commencement um, of the, uh, the um, domestic abuse provisions. Um, and that is the key question, because provided that doesn't happen, we have the time to do the due diligence, and it doesn't prevent us from going ahead in circumstances where the repercussive um, implications are so significant as to make it impossible to proceed. Thank you, Minister. And, and certainly, um, this is at the end of the day, this is about a, a waiver of a financial eligibility limit for victims and survivors of abuse. Um, and that should not be forgotten in all of this, but I don't believe that the block grant should be used for schemes in other jurisdictions. It's very simple. So I am sympathetic to the Minister's concerns, um, as outlined in the letter and today. But I have a number, just a number of quick, just I suppose a statement on, on, and it is from the press release about the scope of legal aid, including those who perpetrated the violence. Um, and I've said this before, that is surely covered in the Minister's Amendment in Section 2 on the eligibility criteria and would be worked through. So I, I, don't, I don't buy that argument in terms of opening it up. And, I, and I'm more than happy, and have said before, to work on, on wording. And I believe that that is in well, the amendments that we were to be debated yesterday. And, and, and with respect, that is the point that we were speaking of the amendment, uh, the clause as it stands. And that is an accurate reflection of the clause as it stands. Um, and my amendment has not yet been passed. So the statement is accurate in terms of the amendment as it stands. If my amendment is passed, it is correct that only respondents will be able um, to benefit from this. And that should help to prevent um, those who are um, perpetrators of domestic abuse being able to misrepresent themselves in order to use the um, legal aid system um, to continue to perpetrate abuse on their, on their partner um, or other member of the family. But as it stands, that is currently the case, that that would be possible, and that is why there, there is a significant <laughs> reduction in terms of limiting it only to respondents. And I, well, I'm sure we can debate this in, in the floor of the House, but I would um, argue that it's not the respondent, it is the eligibility criteria that the Department has set itself that will actually weed out those that are seeking to misrepresent themselves as victims when in fact they are perpetrators. It's, it both, of, it's both of those things, um, because actually it does both. It tries, in terms of the eligibility criteria, um, as you know, we're trying to work through that at the moment in terms of how that could be done. Um, and I think you've been involved in the discussions with the department on that, and that has been incredibly helpful. Um, because I think again, we're all in, we're all intent on doing the same thing. It is an issue that has been raised with me many times um, as a constituency MLA, and indeed by friends who have had to go through um, the family courts. Um, and so I think this is something that will actually be beneficial if we can do it in a way that doesn't expose the department and the block grant to excessive risk. Um, and so it's a bit of both um, in terms of the implications of actually the amendment restricting um, some of the um, ability of those who are respondents, first of all, um, being eligible, and then the actual criteria through which people are eligible. Thank you, Minister. Um, in terms of the recursive costs, is there any examples of a precedent of this um, in terms of you know, what, what evidence is the assumptions based on that the block grant would be used to fund legal aid elsewhere? Is it Brought, uh, brought up by the Department of Finance officials, or is there other precedent that has been set through any other judicial action? Um, the Department of Finance officials raised it because it forms part of Treasury rules and guidance, and therefore it is something that we have to we have to provide against, um, and that we have to be sure that nothing that we do would have repercussive implications. Um, any deviation, as you know, from parity can have consequences um, in terms of the block grant. So, for example, if you look at the situation um, with RHI, where we deviated from the scheme in England and Wales, 
um, and our scheme was more generous. That didn't come through. Um, that didn't come through the Treasury paying all of the scheme. They only indemnified us up to the cost of the scheme in England and Wales, the equivalent cost for Northern Ireland, and that is where the debate arose as to whether or not there were significant costs likely to be incurred by the block grant in Northern Ireland. That's the reverse situation of the one that we're concerned about, which is actually where somebody claims in England and Wales um, that they have been disadvantaged by not having access to something that someone could have access to in Northern Ireland. So, yes, there are examples um, of where it has operated um, in terms of the block grant potentially being put at risk, um, but not in the not not that I'm aware of in the current circumstances, though. I mean, there have been other challenges, for example, on the number of um, cycles of IVF and so on that people are entitled to in different parts of the UK. There has been considerable um, challenge around that, and in some cases, those have been resolved either by departments deciding to go ahead and change the policy here, um, or um, because or, or simply resisting that um, based on the fact that it was unaffordable. Um, and I'm not sure that any of those have made it to court. But where someone takes a case to court, um, it does have, have consequences. There is an example um, which is which is I think either currently before the courts or maybe that is a case that's being defended by Carolyn Killen um, as minister as communities minister, um, where she had to essentially take um, a defensive position in the case of the six month rule um, in benefits for people who have um, terminal illnesses because if she did not defend that case at court, even though she disagrees with fundamentally with the principle that she is defending, if she did not, um, de if she did not defend that case at court, and the case was won in Northern Ireland, then the principle would be overturned in the rest of the UK also, and the Department for Communities would become liable um, for the costs of the six-month rule. And that advice was given to um, the executive and to um, the minister, and therefore um, the minister was put in an invidious situation in that case where she had to defend something which I think we would all agree um, was not uh, an appropriate piece of legislation, but she had no choice because the alternative would have been to pay potentially um, the costs um, if, uh, of the change right across the UK from the Northern Ireland Block Grant. So these are real and present issues. They are not um, fanciful. They are not imaginary. They are real and present, and every minister has to grapple with them at some point. Um, and this is one point at which we are having to grapple with this one. Um, has you, um, you yourself, and, and obviously I'm not too sure if you could speak for Minister Murphy, but any officials contacted the Treasury to get confirmation of the costs of these percussive costs? It wouldn't be um, for Treasury to provide that. Um, this would come as a result of a sequence of events. Um, it's our job to do the due diligence. We already know the Treasury rules. We already know um, how it operates. And so it's our job to do due diligence to ensure that we're that we're protected against those particular costs. This, if we dis if this is discovered to be repercussive, so that's one outcome. If this is discovered to be repercussive, it doesn't mean that we will automatically owe money um, to the MOJ. It would lie with somebody having to first of all take a legal challenge and be successful in that legal challenge, and then the degree to which it is repercussive would be decided in the courts. And then that is a discussion that would have to happen with Treasury. So there are a number of stages in this which we can't predict the outcome of. All we can do is look at to what degree we're exposed um, in terms of risk and then try to mitigate that risk as best we can. And that is what we're trying to do um, by ensuring that we can complete the due diligence without endangering all of the other um, all of the other measures in the bill. And I agree um, entirely that these are these are sensitive issues. We recognise that many people um, have suffered serious financial um, harm as a result um, of what is essentially an extension of financial um, coercive control by a partner um, through the family courts, and it is well documented. Um, as I explained, there are other um, mitigations against that, um, and I would hope to see those used um, more Frequently, um, in terms of judges, for example, um, looking at the potential for vexatious cases and so on, and there are, as I say, there are options for them to do that. So there are a number of issues around this, but in terms of the fundamental point, um, we have to mitigate against this risk, but we cannot, Treasury would not be able to tell us now um, what that risk is likely to be, because it would result at the end of a court case, and it would also, remember, be demand-led, so it would depend how many people in any year then chose to use this mechanism.
in order to seek legal aid in England and Wales. Um, and so it's really how long is a piece of string? It, it, we can't we can't judge that. We can only give, and this is one of the reasons why we're very reluctant about giving out figures on this. Um, but felt we needed to give some substance to the concern we had. Um, it can only really be a very rough estimate based on population at this stage. Thank you, Minister. And just on that, and I know that there are rough estimates, and um, mentioned earlier on that they are crude estimates in terms of using population equivalents. But in how how the, the uh, quantities were reached? Was it the numbers of people in the rest of the UK by population size? Is it the number of people going through the family courts or seeking child contact orders, being responded to child contact orders, or the prevalence of domestic abuse in certain society that was used as the crude estimate? It was a population um, estimate. And the population wouldn't estimate. have ready access to those other metrics easily. And the population estimate was used because that is the rough basis on which the Barnet formula operates. Thank you. Um, the, if, if there would, I appreciate that they again the potential costs are are estimates, but how if there is any more information on how they have been calculated? I think I've already given the information that we have about how they've been estimated, and um, that's the purpose of the further due diligence work, in addition to the legal advice, to understand more, more completely what the likely or potential cost impacts would be. The issue with Amendment 15 is the fact that it ties the comm commencement of legal aid provisions with the new offence, or is the issue the fact that it commences the legal aid provisions? It is that it, it ties the comm well, first of all, it ties the, our hands on the commencement, and it further ties it's both. It ties the legal aid provisions um, commencement to the offence's commencement. So in circumstances where the due diligence shows that this would have significant repercussive implications for, G, for GB um, and therefore on the block grant, we would first of all not have the opportunity to not commence the legal aid provisions but to commence the offences. So the entire bill would, sound, would essentially be suspended. Um, and the secondary part of that is that were we to discover that this had serious repercussive costs, to be clear, we would be coming back to the committee. The, the Assembly made a decision, and that was that they wanted to allow some form of legal aid waiver for those who are victims of domestic abuse and domestic violence. That is the will of the Assembly. So at that point where we believe that these particular provisions in the Bill could not be commenced in, a, in circumstances where the repercussiveness um, of this in GB was too significant, we would then have to come back to the Committee and provide an alternative mechanism to achieve that objective, because that is what the Assembly has agreed to do. So we would then come back and either look at regulations um, or an alternative that would allow us um, to do what the intent of the Assembly was because that is what binds the decisions that we make. Thank you, and I, I do appreciate that. Um, but I, I do have concerns that if we had something in a bill and it wasn't commenced, but that was from last week, and I do appreciate the, um, the reassurance that the Minister has given in the last couple of days on that that would happen. But is it possible, in your view, to disentangle the commencement of the legal aid provisions from the commencement of the new offence while ensuring it both come into operation and is that way us not moving Amendment 15? It is not possible to require commencement of the legal aid provisions and the bill still to be coherent. It is possible to disentangle the legal aid provision from the uh, abuse provisions in order that we can do the due diligence required. And if that due diligence says that there is not a significant risk of repercussiveness, then we can commence both at the same time as intended. If it says that there is a significant risk of repercussiveness, we can look to see are there mitigations that we can put in place before we would actually commence um, that, that particular um, section on legal aid. Um, and if in extremists there were no mitigations that could be provided against that repercussiveness and so it was we could not safely commence that part of the bill we would still be able to commence um, the offences um, within the bill and then come back to the committee in slower time with an alternative mechanism um, to achieve what the assembly has directed that we should do 
So with, by disentangling those two things, we protect um, the position that we would still be able to commence the provision um, for the particular offences uh, without that being um, tied to us being able to be confident um, that there's no repercussive implications of the legal aid. We can't give a commitment on the legal aid in terms of having a separate commencement because we don't know at this stage whether it will be possible or not to commence the legal aid portion because of the potential repercussiveness of it. And we will not know that until we have done full due diligence and the bill by that stage. We can, I mean, that is the alternative, of course, that we simply pause this and do nothing until we have that piece of work done. But I think that that is contrary to what people had intended, which is that we would bring these offences into place as quickly as possible. By decoupling that, we can still do that and also progress those aspects on legal aid um, to ensure that we can safely um, bring those forward, um, either by the commencement of the provisions in the bill, if they're not repercussive, or by an alternative means, if they are. Thank you, Minister. And I'll not take any very much longer, but in terms of... I, I appreciate the answer there. Could Amendment 15 be altered or amended? Anything that requires us to commence the legal aid provisions in the bill will cause me not to be able um, to move forward with the bill. Okay. Um, just to clarify then um, that the... If I, could, if I could be clear, it is highly unusual for a committee or a legislature to say when a minister or department will commence any parts of a bill. That is a highly unusual measure in legislation. It is normal um, because of the potential um, pitfalls around these issues where things change or need corrected or amended um, post the point um, of passage of a bill um, that the Minister and Department are allowed uh, to make those judgments as to when is the best time to commence the provisions. Um, however, we have set down in the bill um, our intention in terms of commencement. We have been clear about that from the outset. In terms of actually insisting on the commencement of the legal aid provisions being on the face of the legislation, that does create a specific problem, given that we cannot confidently say um, at this stage that the legal aid provisions could be uh, could be commenced. And I can't sit here, frankly, and pretend um, that I would be comfortable with that because that would be dishonest. Um, so if I were to agree to a longer um, commencement time for these legal aid provisions, knowing full well that in light of any legal advice I get, it may not be possible to ever commence them, I believe I would be misleading the committee. So I'm being very clear that any requirement on me um, in the face of the legislation to commence the provisions in legal aid at this point in time would have to be resisted. And I believe given the risk um, to the block grant, we would not be able to proceed with the bill. There, I've made it also clear um, that it is my intention to commence both at the same time if that is possible after due diligence has been completed and I've been clear and robust about that on a number of occasions and Peter has also um, made it clear that based on the 1995 case I have an obligation um, to do so um, under law so it's not just a commitment that I've given it's actually a legal obligation. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, Linda Dahl. Thank you. I thank the Minister and Peter both for coming to the committee and the Chair for calling the, the meeting today because it, it certainly has been helpful, I think, in clarifying things out. I suppose it would be clear from last Thursday that I was never very comfortable with the commencement. I, sure, I certainly wasn't happy to commence in relation to um, Rachel's amendment. That's all on the record why I had, had issues with that. Not because of the intent, and, and Rachel knows that, because I know that the intent of this is absolutely um, good and honourable and it's the right intent around protecting victims and allowing them access to legal aid. Both just to, to nail it down, I think at this point we can all agree we all want to get to the same place. It's just about how we get there. And I had spoken to the Minister yesterday prior to um, going into the Chamber, but obviously I could only give assurances around what, what, how my party would vote. And I did give assurances that we would vote against the commencement. And that was on the basis that I was not prepared to allow this bill to be delayed. I think that that is unacceptable. Just being, being perfectly honest about it. We were very clear from the outset whenever we took on to do this piece of legislation that it was really important to all of us to get this on the books as quickly as possible. 
Having said all that, we did make a number of amendments which <laughs> did delay it, but, but that's okay. We wanted it to be the best piece of legislation that we could possibly have. And I do think the intention of the committee and all of their amendments was about making this better legislation. It was never about being difficult or about being obstructive. And I appreciate that the department worked with us on a number of those amendments, and you know, specifically around that were very important to me. That was around the protection notices and orders and around the information sharing with education settings. So, having said all that, I mean, our position remains the same. I'm prepared to not vote for the commencement, even if it's left on the books as, as an amendment and is moved. That will be our party's position because it does carry too great a risk in terms of not only now delaying. I already had concerns when, when I thought it might delay the, the rest of the bill, but where you now have a potential where it, it's not going to come into place at all based on potential recent costliness is just too, too big of a concern for me. And I, I'm not prepared to see this not going onto the books. On that basis, I share all of the concerns that that other members have around the legal aid and the commencement, but I accept the Minister's reassurances around it. And I think we have a responsibility as a committee to ensure and to hold the Minister to account. That's our job. And that's what I'll certainly be doing, and I don't expect any less from any other member of the committee. So that is my position in relation to that specific amendment. Obviously, there are a number of other amendments, and I have spoken to officials you know, at the end of last week to clarify positions around amendments because I want to make sure at the end of this that we make good law, that we make the right law, that we make something that is deliverable for victims. And for me, that's, that's important. You know, there, there's a whole section of people out there that aren't having a say in this because they don't know yet that they're actually going to need this. And we need to look after those people too. They don't have any say in this. They haven't responded to stakeholders because they don't know yet that they are stakeholders. I think we have to consider all of that whenever we're looking at this. And for me, that, that's vital. And I've spoken to, to the stakeholders in the sector over the weekend as well because obviously I want to hear from everybody. I'm not, I'm, I'm not taking the department's position or, or, or any specific stakeholder's position. I'm taking everything, every bit of information that I can, can get my hands on and in the round trying to come not to the perfect position because there isn't one particularly in relation to the specific issue but to the best position that I can find and for me and I've, I've said this to the Minister 27A is actually as important to me as 27 because that's our best place to perhaps find where I want to get to and where I know the rest of this committee want to get to and, and I certainly hope that the, the Minister and the Department want to get to and that's to a point where we can actually improve the access to legal aid where it's not just as, as tight as it is at the moment. To my question, apologies for cutting it out now, but I, I just wanted to make my position clear and I think it's fair to the rest of the committee for, for me to set out our, our own party position. The question is actually on a, on a slightly um, different vein and that's around the eligibility, you know, who would be considered a victim. And can I clarify, if it was the case where if I were to support, for example, Rachel's current amendment, where it would be ap applicants as well as respondents, that's not my intention at this moment in time, but I just need to clarify this, rather than the, the ministers around respondents, does that potentially narrow? And, and, and I suppose I'm asking you to be as upfront as you have been in, in relation to everything else. Does that narrow the potential for who is a victim? And is the reality that it could potentially become only where there's a conviction? Can you consider that person to be to be a victim? Because that narrows it so much that sure. that that's kind of why, where I find myself supporting probably your sure. amendment over and above because of, of that concern. And so I'm asking for the same frame. Okay. Well, look, there are a couple of parts to what you've said. I mean, first of all. Um, uh, to be clear, I think the amendments that the committee have made and the scrutiny of the committee have been helpful. I think the bill is better as a result of it, and I think it has been enhanced. 
I don't think that there is any difference between the sector, between the committee and between ourselves and the department in terms of what we're trying to achieve, either on the main thrust of the bill or indeed on the legal aid provisions, because I think that we all accept, um, as I've said already, that there is an issue um, that we have identified um, in terms of um, people who are constantly dragged to court um, by a, a, a partner with vexatious complaints um, and that it can be um, financially um, painful, um, to put it mildly, um, for them to continue to go to court um, and defend those issues, and that is a challenge. So I don't think there's any difference in terms of intent. There may be a difference in terms of approach of how we would go about it, um, but I think that the intent is the same, that we get to a point where we can provide legal aid to those who are genuine victims of, of domestic abuse, um, and that we can um, move forward in terms of getting the offences on the books. In terms of um, the eligibility criteria, I'll maybe hand over to Peter in terms of the, the, the work that's going on within um, LSA on this. But obviously there are challenges in terms of how we determine who is a victim. One of the easiest ways to do this is to look at what we're actually trying to prevent happening. So what happens in most of the cases that I receive complaints about is that um, person A, the abuser, will continually want to take person B, um, the um, victim, into the courtroom over and over and over again um, in order that person B is financially constrained because they're having to pay for legal advice and for support and other things, um, but also because it causes psychological trauma to be constantly tied um, to this person. So if by saying that only respondents to cases, that the waiver only applies with respondents, we immediately rule out the possibility of person A getting legal aid to do that, okay, to initiate proceedings that would drag somebody back into court. So we're not saying that if somebody has a genuine reason to go to court that they wouldn't be able to get legal aid, but it would be the normal means tested manner of legal aid that would apply in other cases. What we are saying is that the waiver would only apply in those cases where you were responding. So someone who persistently brings you to court, you, the respondent, could access this waiver if you were a victim of domestic abuse or violence. So that cuts out the opportunity for, for example, um, a, a perpetrator of domestic abuse to claim that they are a victim of domestic abuse gain legal aid and then use public funds to drag their partner into court while their partner then has to come and also try to establish that they're entitled to the waiver. And that could actually increase, first of all, the number of cases that would be taken, which is contrary to what the department is trying to do, which is to encourage um, non-court based outcomes for families so that there's more um, upfront negotiation and support um, and arbitration between partners rather than simply recourse to the courts but also more fundamentally it could lead to an increase in the number of people who are perpetrators actually taking their partners through the court system repeatedly because there would be essentially no jeopardy um, or little jeopardy because they would have legal aid to cover the costs so in doing that we're we're immediately reducing this to deal with the specific issue of somebody being brought back and forward to court repeatedly. So that's the reason why we're focused on respondents. With respect to the issue that I think LSA are looking at is about the eligibility criteria. And we recognise that there are issues with saying, and I mean, Rachel, I know, has had discussions with um, LSA on this. I can just encourage a bit more gravity, so yeah. thank you. The, the issue um, around that is very specific. Um, in that we recognise that having a conviction for an offence um, is quite a high bar, that somebody may be leaving a partner, for example, rather than taking them through the courts and often not to go to court, um, but instead just simply want to be able to leave, take their children with them and break contact. Um, and in cases like that, it would be very difficult to say that without a, legal, uh, without a conviction, there would need to be... Um, there would not be able to be um, any support. But there does have to be some threshold, and this is the area that we've been looking at. So I'm going to pass to Peter on that one, because um, we are trying to look at what that threshold would be, what evidentiary test there would be, again, to stop people um, abusing the system. Um, because it is important that this is public money and that those who are in need of it are able to reach it. 
there's no quibble on people who are entitled actually being able to get it. The concern would be about those who ought not to be entitled being able to get it, and that is something that we have to do due diligence around. Um, I don't have a lot to add because this is work that's still going on and we haven't reached a conclusion. We'll come back to the committee at the point when we have proposals. Um, but essentially, I think the Minister is correct to draw out that if there was a very broad waiver, in other words, both um, defendants and applicants, then there would be a need to probably define much more tightly uh, the, the victim eligibility because of the risk that there would be about perpetrators otherwise securing legal aid. Um, so if the consequence of that is if there's a narrower waiver, then it ought to be easier to, uh, to draw a slightly less restrictive um, definition. But we are still in the middle of thinking this through. We don't have yet uh, answers, I'm afraid, on exactly, exactly how we would do that. Can I just ask one question? Are, are you engaging with organisations around that issue, or will you be at, at, at some point whenever you're looking at proposals? Because obviously, I mean, they work quite a bit with... Yes. With the yes. Thank you. In terms of the, the timings, a further consideration stage was taken next week. When do you anticipate final stage? Um, in the new year, as early as possible. The Assembly plenaries from start back, I think it's the 18th. Yeah. Um, it would probably be the week commencing the 18th that we would be seeking to have the final stage. And what's the time frame for getting your legal advice and due diligence carried out? Um, I think, um, as I said, that we would be looking, um, as I said earlier, to having the legal advice this side. Council advice this side of Christmas, consideration of it in the new year, um, but I couldn't commit um, to a time frame in terms of the due diligence because that may in turn raise further questions that we need to pursue in the department. So um, we just have to take we just have to take our way through this as we go. Um, but obviously we want to complete it as soon as possible because that will allow us then to move on to the other preparatory work that needs to be done in terms of operationalising the bill um, before commencement. And if the Assembly proceeded with voting for uh, this commencement, the Amendment 15, what options would be available to, to the Department um, if, after having conducted the due diligence, there was this repercussive impact of £400 million, pounds, to then come back to the Assembly to say, there's now legislation, there is a, a very real issue, um, and I cannot now commence the offences part one and two, or, or the chapters one and two, um, of this bill because of this issue. What powers are available to the department to then seek the Assembly to remove that? Um, the only powers, as far as I'm aware, that we would have at that stage would be for us um, to, first of all, not commence anything. That would be the first thing. Uh, we couldn't commence anything, and we would need to find another uh, primary legislation vehicle, um, and Peter can keep me right on this, in order to make cha to bring forward changes, um, amendments to the bill, and that I think would not be possible in this mandate. Is that a reasonable assessment? Um, the timings um, are, are obviously dependent on how quickly we identify the problem, but the yep. primary legislation can only be changed by primary legislation. So you could, you have your miscellaneous justice provisions mm -hmm. bill, so you could repeal this if the assembly proceeded, or you could introduce a very one-line piece of legislation, get accelerated passage, which I'm sure people would grant, and within weeks you could repeal it. Um, as I said, you can, you can change primary legislation through primary legislation, it's just it would be odd to pass primary legislation in the knowledge that there could be a problem. And it would also, I think, be a difficult argument for me to make to executive colleagues that I was going to um, continue down a route that I knew exposed us to considerable risk on the basis that we would vote for that and then repeal it later. Um, the sensible thing would be not to do it in the first place. OK. What about to try and find a way for everyone to, to get off this issue? What if the Amendment 15 was amended to include provision for the Department being able, by way of regulation, to take forward an affirmative resolution of the Assembly to rescind it? Then you can proceed. Then the, you can come forward with a position if this transpires to be the case. That way everybody wins. 
Well, it's really not about everybody winning because I didn't think it was a battle. It's about trying to get the bill through and in order to try to ensure that we don't have repercussive implications and are able to advance all of the parts of this. I mean, I've been clear um, that it is my intention um, to, um, to commence all parts of the bill, including um, the clauses on legal aid. So that is my intention. Um, so I don't think it's about winners and losers in this. It's not a battle of wills. It's about trying to get the right decision. Um, and there is no intent on our part not to commence the legal aid provisions um, unless this repercussive issue is there. And there is already guidance, as Peter has, has, has read out, um, in respect of the legal requirements on me to do so. I'm trying to, to find a middle way so we can make progress collectively on this. That's why I'm making the suggestion. I would need to get advice from the Assembly if that, if that is a, an amendment that can be made to that amendment. But are you saying it's either your way or no way? That's not what I'm saying, Chair. Um, I'm simply suggesting that the simplest resolution of this is to remove Amendment 15. That allows us then to do what exactly what you suggest which is um, to progress the legal aid um, and commence it if we can, and if we can't, to come back to the committee and then resolve how else we can implement the will of the Assembly in that respect. Is, is it normal to prevent the Assembly from having its consideration stage on the precondition the political parties need to tell you how they're going to vote on amendments that members are entitled to put forward? That was not the precondition on which um, we were going to have the further consideration stage, um, Chairman. Um, the, I can't bring forward the consideration stage while the risk of Amendment 15 being passed remains live. It would be irresponsible of me to do so. Um, however, in, on, a, on a matter of trust, um, if I were aware that that amendment wasn't going to be pressed, um, then I would be willing to take the committee and indeed other colleagues at face value um, and accept their integrity around this issue in order that we can make quick progress. Um, I mean, I could of course say that I won't move it until that amendment is, is withdrawn, physically withdrawn, or that a further amendment is physically tabled. Um, but I would be willing, I think, um, on the basis of trust to progress, because I think the more important thing is that we actually get this done. Um, and that is why I said that I would be happy um, on the understanding that Amendment 15 would not proceed. Um, that I would be happy to come back and have the further consideration stage. But it's not a matter of political opinion. It is a matter of my ministerial responsibilities. And I couldn't proceed while that was at risk of being passed in the chamber. And that is, it's, it's a simple... Um, I mean, I didn't, I didn't enter into the decision lightly um, not to move the further consideration stage um, yesterday. I had prepared for it, um, and I was looking forward to the... Um, conclusion of this before Christmas, um, but in light of the new information that came um, to my attention, I had no alternative um, because I wasn't in a position to know what the mind of the Assembly might be on Amendment 15, and the risk of it passing therefore was too great um, in terms of the, the damage and harm that would be caused to the Bill and by consequence um, to those who are reliant on the domestic abuse provisions being passed. So you're, you're not asking, just so that I know clarity, you're not asking for commitments that executive parties would then instruct their MLAs to vote for your amendment three and against amendments four, five and six? Yes, I will be asking for that at executive, but I'm not asking it from the committee. I'm asking for the committee um, a particular request on amendment 15, which is specific. Um, my general request um, is in line with the provisions and the regulations and advice set out for guidance to ministers on how to deal with legislation, makes clear um, in that advice and guidance which is issued to ministers on dealing with executive legislation, um, that where there are issues being brought forward by amendment um, and that they change the nature or the provisions in the bill, or where they represent a policy change, other than those which are considered um, to be uh, minor, that they have to be brought to the executive for agreement where I choose to amend the bill or where I choose to resist an amendment um, on, a matter, um, on such a matter um, of a committee or an individual member, that has to be brought to executive for agreement. And it also states further in that guidance that it is the duty of members of the executive to seek the support of their colleagues in the legislature um, to ensure that the executive's will is passed um, in the chamber. So, 
does beg the question if the executive are going to then instruct the MLAs what to do, what's the point in the Assembly in this case? Well, it is a matter for executive parties um, to decide. Obviously, not all members um, of the committee um, are executive parties. Furthermore, um, there will always be rebels in any party, as the member well knows. Um, and therefore, people will choose to do what they will. I can only progress on the basis of um, the executive advice. I am a minister. I am bound by the code of conduct for ministers. And I'm also bound um, by the advice and guidance that is presented to me as a minister in terms of how I take these things forward. This has been a matter of discussion not only between ministers at the executive, but also, I have to say, between party leaders. There seems to be a fundamental misunderstanding um, from parties in the executive um, based on their own advice and guidance as to what it means, um, the consequences of it, and indeed what it is to be in a five-party government, because it is a five-party government. And in any other coalition government, members of those parties would be expected to support the government in its objectives. This is a government bill, not a Department of Justice bill, um, and therefore it would be understood that in a five-party coalition government, members of the government parties would support the minister. Um, that has not been the case to date, um, and there will be further discussions in executive about this um, in slower time, and that has already been agreed um, by the party leaders. Um, and so I will continue to write to the executive to notify them of any changes I propose, to note them of any changes that the committee propose, and to note my position with respect um, to the various issues in terms of whether I intend to oppose, support, um, or amend any part of the bill, um, because that's my duty. Okay. Well, I appreciate your interpretation of how government should work vis-à-vis -vis then its assembly and my responsibility as an FLA, I beg the devil. Sinead Bradley, With respect, it's it? not, Mr Chairman, it's not my interpretation of how government should work. It is a factual representation of how government and, co and coalition does work. But further, it is, the legis it is the guidance that is issued to all ministers in respect of how we take forward legislation. It is not something that was agreed in my time in the executive, it precedes my time in the executive, and I am simply bound by it. I am certainly not rebelling in the position that I am taking this party. Shania Bradley. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just to go back on a point, Chair, you raised, and, and I take it in the spirit that it was raised. Um, as you know, yesterday it was disappointing um, in the moment when it when the bill didn't proceed, and I immediately called on you to, to call this meeting, and also to be for an emergency meeting with the Minister, which helped. But I also took it on myself to, to try and explore other options, as you indicated, the possibility of, and I accept what the Minister saying, that a delayed commencement is maybe not helpful or the solution, but I did inquire with the Bills Office about the potential of a delayed, conditional delayed um, response, but we weren't able to pin that down, and I just thought that might be helpful in the deliberations. That it, unfortunately, it wasn't a solution that um, could come to pass. But I take it in the spirit, Chair, that you offered it here as well. Okay, thanks, Sinead. Yes, Paul. Just, just a quick one. Just a quick one on the executive piece, Minister. What did What did you advise the executive around your amendment B and the cost risks around that? And what did the executive tell you back? Um, I advised them of what I was doing. I wrote to them, um, as I said earlier, and um, we didn't do um, full due diligence on it because it would be a reduction of the current situation. So my initial um, uh, my initial request to executive was to resist um, the legal aid amendment um, because it wasn't um, fully formed and we hadn't done a proper appraisal of it. And when it came to the point then where I was amending it in order to restrict it further, um, the key issue for the executive was that that would reduce the implications of a decision already taken by the Assembly and therefore binding um, on the executive. Um, and so from my perspective, I didn't need, if you like, to do specific due diligence on that particular amendment because it would have reduced the overall impact um, of the original change. And that would be done in due course, which is the process that we're now engaged in. Did you also advise the executive that you could, that it's possible for you to amend Amendment 15? No, I didn't advise the executive that it was possible for me to amend um, Amendment 15 because it's not something 
um, that I would have been able to do um, in the time that was available, um, nor is it something because, as you know, the opportunity for further amendments had closed at that point. And it's also not my duty to inform executive of amendments that I may bring to the um, bill's office. It is my duty to inform them of amendments that I am bringing to the bill um, and of my position on amendments that have been tabled by others. And that's what I did in the correspondence that I had with the executive um, in relation to my duties um, to report to the executive committee. If an executive minister wrote to you asking or advising you to amend Amendment 15 or any other amendment, how would you respond to that? I would consider their advice okay. and I would then respond. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Any other trans members can then include um, the amendment of this women's aid or under the test that I have been suspended for five months. Correct something wrong with Thanks. <laughs> so forgive me, members, for having to do that. But okay, well, listen, we'll suspend for five minutes. Okay. Thank you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room. Okay, members, welcome back to the. Justice Committee, and can I welcome um, Sonia McMullen from uh, Women's Aid uh, to the meeting today. Um, obviously, members, we've heard what the Minister has said in respect of these issues um, around the legal aid aspect of it, uh, and I was keen to, to get speaking with Women's Aid on this, because I know this has been a, an issue that, through the evidence sessions, was being raised with us. Um, and obviously, Sonia, you will be across the position as far as possible and trying to understand the assembly procedures and all of these different moving and not moving bills and so on. Um, but as, as presently articulated by the Minister, um, she's not moving the further consideration stage because of an issue around the legal aid provisions being associated with the offence coming in uh, to operation um, and wants to remove that aspect in terms of that amendment going forward so that it's not in the bill. So I'm just keen if you're able to, to give us a view on the kind of feedback that you've had from your organisation over the last 24 hours and your views on this. Thank you very much for giving us the opportunity to come up and speak to you all today. And first of all, I'd just like to thank all of the committee members for all of their work individually on the bill. You know, it's been a really good example of a committee that's really committed to um, a victim's focused bill, you know, and you've really listened to all of um, the people who have come before you and the testimonies of those individuals as well. So we really welcome that and just would like to um, acknowledge that. Um, I suppose yesterday in relation to the turn of events, we um, were very disappointed um, at the pausing. Um, you know, we've been going along um, at a, a good rate and um, not reaching the further consideration stage yesterday was um, very disappointing. But we do understand there are a number of things to consider in relation to the costings um, that the Minister has um, just discussed. But in conversations that we've had um, over the last 24 hours with our membership, we have eight local women's aid groups across Northern Ireland, and of course then with the women who are engaged in our services, um, they are really pleased that legal aid is actually on the table and is being discussed. They can't believe this, you know, that it's reached um, this point and they welcome that. And do you know the number of people I spoke to that said they were willing to wait and happy to wait um, to get the bill right? Um, and I think we have to listen to victims, to survivors, and everyone has talked about you know, the impact. I have numerous case studies here um, in relation to the impact um, not only on financial abuse post-separation, but also, um, you know, that re-traumatisation. There was one woman there who actually lost her job because, you know, she had to attend court and was in and out so much, and um, childcare and all those sort of issues. And, you know, we cannot underestimate, and it goes on, it's so long, in relation to child contact, until a child is of a certain age, you are going to be in and out of the court system. Um, so um, we, as an organisation, really welcome this, and um, we would be supporting, um, you know, really, I know there is an issue with regard to the commencement date, but... Um, I think there's a lot of things that aren't answered with regard to costings and I don't understand all the things because I'm not a legislator so I'm trying to mm. keep up with it all as best um, 
um, as I can, but um, generally our um, position would be that we would be supporting the amendment as originally presented, you know, by Rachel and um, Sinead in relation to those points in that particular amendment. Um, legal aid needs a whole review um, in Northern Ireland. Um, the Minister discussed the issue of it being abused by perpetrators. It's already being abused by perpetrators. You know, we have, um, as I say, a number of case studies here. Um, I have about eight of them, and every one of them, the woman is paying for her legal costs, and every one of the perpetrators um, is in access and receipt of legal aid. You know, and of course you're going to bring someone back in and out of court if you're in receipt of legal aid. It's not, um, you know, it's that further financial abuse when someone has lost control and um, that post-separation abuse that we see happening all the time. So that's really um, our position um, within, you know, the organisation and within um, the women that come through the services at the moment. In terms of information, we, we've been trying to clarify what is the cost of these kind of legal cases, and it has taken a long time to get figures, albeit estimates. Um, and what has struck me um, is this figure that Clause 27, as now voted upon through the Assembly, the Department are estimating, could be around £14 million. Is, is that indicative of the scale of the financial costs that victims of domestic abuse are facing when it comes to legal cases being taken around contact orders? Yeah, well, I suppose if you look, um, the number of cases that I have here, um, that people would have um, applied for maybe a non-molestation order, an ex party, then another order. Um, there would be contact cases, there could be divorce cases, there could be um, a breach of a non-molestation order. You know, numerous different things. So it's not all one. You know, the first one there, that's 4,500, but it's still ongoing. Um, this woman total case is 3,000, that's for a non-molestation order and an occupation order. And she's had to set up a direct debit with a barrister for £150 a month to cover her costs. You know, um, whenever I spoke to one of the women last night, she actually said this could be a tangible product that could come out of the end, you know, the other end of this bill. That would be so important and it would mean to me how much oil I could put in my tank and how much food I can put on the table for my children, you know, that's the reality. Um, you know, we've long talked about the, the cost of protection, and we know that the previous Justice Minister, David Ford, did bring in um, the means-tested waiver in relation to non-molestation orders. Um, but it's not very widely taken up, and there's that very low threshold again that we, you know, have concerns about. There shouldn't be a cost of protection. And then if we get into, I suppose, the new orders that we are... Um, would be in support of, you know, that the police officer can bring that, you know, and take that out of the hands of the victim. Um, and also the cost wouldn't be there too, you know. Why should you have to pay for um, protection? And then we have the case of many women going to represent themselves. And that leaves a real vulnerability with you whenever you're trying to represent yourself in a court of law. And a lot of the evidence that I had heard and, and members heard um, that this promise of legal aid reform has been going on for years and the, this, these problems have been identified for years and yet it still hasn't happened. Um, and so I suppose the intent for, and those members can speak for themselves because it wasn't a, it, this wasn't a Justice Committee amendment. Um, it was an amendment brought by um, Rachel Woods and Sinead and Paul have, have sought to brought other amendments around this legal aid and the Assembly then can vote on them. Um, but it's now in the bill, um, and the concern, of course, has been it can be on the bill, but if it's not actually going to be commenced, then the concern is that it may not happen. And I know commitments have been made and promises have been made that that wouldn't be the case. And that's where I think members are trying to come to a view. Should we continue to seek that this is commenced? Um, or do we remove that commencement provision on the basis of this is going to be taken forward um, without actually having a legal effect to it? Is that whenever you said people are prepared to wait? Is that prepared yeah, to wait? We have a fear that um, that commencement may never happen, you know, and that's the reality of it. And to have it here being discussed today at the Justice Committee, we have come a long way, uh, you know. Um, 
um, to get that far. We've been talking about legal aid and provisions of legal aid, as you say, and I know the Minister has said that they're looking at a policy review in relation to legal aid provision here in Northern Ireland. And we, you know, we have seen that it has narrowed and it has gone down. But if you look at um, a family lawyer, I think their average hourly rate is about £58 an hour, I think it is. But that has stayed the same, you know, for many years with regard to, um, you know, we have to say a lot of the solicitors in Northern Ireland are very good and the barristers allowing people to pay off their legal fees, you know, um, as well. And there's a lot of goodwill there too. But we do have a fear that this will... Um, not be commenced. There seems to be a real haste. There's an awful lot of things going through um, the Department of Justice at the moment with regard to you know, the strangulation and looking at the rough sex consultation. The consultation on the orders came out yesterday as well. You know, And there's an awful lot of our work time in Women's Aid at the moment um, is on all of the consultations that are coming through and all of the work around guidance and task and finish groups and everything. You know, um, We are, of course, as we know, the only part of um, the UK and Ireland that don't have coercive control legislation in place. And that, of course, was because of, you know, no assembly and everything. And we know all of that historically. But, um, yeah, I think we are willing to wait to make sure we get the, you know, we talk about a gold star bill. And that's what we want. You know, I've worked in Women's Aid for a long time. And it was over 20 years ago that we had the last change in legislation through the Family, Homes and Domestic Violence Order. You know, this opportunity doesn't come around a lot. And it could be another 20 or plus years before we have this opportunity again. And we know that the Westminster Bill has so many other provisions that, that we had wanted around housing and secure tenancies and a review of the family court and, you know, um, all of those, the domestic abuse um, commissioner office and all those sort of things. Um, but funding and resourcing of the bill is our great concern as well because, um, you know, we've heard the minister say on a couple of occasions now that there's no money attached to this bill. Well, what's the point in bringing in a piece of legislation if there is no money? And I know, Sinead, you mentioned that earlier in relation to the training and development. And, you know, we need resources attached to this to make it work. And we need investment in domestic violence services um, to make changes. You know, we see the highest number of domestic violence cases coming through um, our PSNI, the latest annual trends. You know, they're going up year on year. And we need to invest in services if we're going to um, change any of this, you know, from early intervention, prevention, all of the things that we know. We're not reinventing the wheel. We know the good practices out there, but we just need investment um, in services. We also have a strategy that has no money attached to it either. You know, and it's, I just don't think it's good enough, and I don't think it will have any teeth if it doesn't have any money attached to it. Well, because it wasn't moved yesterday, um it can't have the final stage and receive royal assent before the end of the year. That's now gone. You know, we know we know even a further consideration stage takes place next week. Final stage now won't be until at the earliest, the third week of January. Um, and there's no commitment that actually that is the case. But nevertheless, that's the earliest final stage is going to come in. Now, I've asked the Minister the question, how quickly can you do the due diligence to address these concerns about the repercussive nature of, of this in terms of what may happen in England in this Treasury book, uh, and obviously um, wasn't able to give a very clear timeline. And I know I'm putting you in a slightly difficult position, but obviously, you know, we're legislators, so we, we need to take that decision ourselves. But are you saying to me that if you were in my position, um, rather than move forward with further consideration stage next week on the basis that the commencement provision is removed, it would be better to wait for further consideration stage until the new year and to allow the department to carry out its due, dil due diligence and hopefully that deals with that concern and then move further consideration stage and retain the commencement aspect so that we know it will definitely will happen. Yes, I think that would be um, Women's Aid's position here. I think there's too many unanswered questions at the moment and we would welcome the consultation and the advice and for the Minister to come back on that, those points, definitely. Okay. I'll bring in other members at this stage. Linda Dillon. Um, I'm glad the Chair has, has clarified that. I suppose I just want to clarify a few things, and, and I, I understand where you're coming from around um, you know, the, the legislative process, for, even for us that's here, as I said, dealing with it day and daily and weekly, 
in, in relation to this issue. It is it is a complex one, but that is why we have worked the way we have on it. We're we really are trying to get it right. When you say that you're you're happy to wait, and I understand where you're coming from. Um, and for me, actually, access to legal aid for victims is important to deal with it all the time. In, in my office, I've dealt with, it with friends and, and people who are close to me around this issue. So there's a couple of things that I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask you about. The repercussiveness in terms of um, England and Wales is one element for, for the Minister in relation to the commencement. However, the potential repercussiveness then here she has outlined is, is another issue so we could be talking about a significant delay and I'm just I'm flagging that up because I'm not sure I, I want to ensure that every bit of advice that we're given particularly from your shares because it, it, it is it is going to certainly have a big impact coming from women's aid that's just being honest we we will certainly have to give a, a good hearing to what, what you're saying. So we need to be clear there could be a significant delay in getting the abuse bill if we take commencement on the legal aid stuff. And whilst I accept entirely everything you're saying about it, the, the, the stuff where people are being repeatedly brought back to court, particularly around that issue, and I know myself and Sinead in, in relation to Rachel's original amendment our understanding certainly was that it was going to be around response because it is that continuous being brought back to court whereas an applicant that is your choice to a certain extent not entirely and I get that and I'm, and I'm quite sure you'll be able to give us examples of that and I would appreciate that actually where it's where an applicant would would need access to this would would be helpful to me even in, in terms of looking at that but that, that's really important for me around the, the length of time that when we're talking about delay, we're not talking about till just after Christmas. I, I don't think it'd be disingenuous for for us as a committee to lead you to believe that because I don't think that's right. I think if we tie the commencement, we may well have a further consideration come forward after Christmas. But when this actually commences is a different matter and that will be in the hands of the department. And there's nothing that we can do in relation to that, as far as I'm aware. So <coughs> if we me. don't put faith in the minister that, you know, remove the commencement and put faith in the minister that she will commence, and she's legally obliged as well. She outlined that, you know, and the permanent secretary outlined that, that she's legally obliged to commence if she can, if the repercussiveness is not an issue. And we can hold her to account as a committee. I've outlined that as well. And you said that you're you're following, so I just I just want to get some sense of of what type of delay or where your thinking is and how long this could potentially be delayed. We need to be mindful that next year we're moving into the final year of this mandate, and I certainly wouldn't be content coming out of this mandate and leaving this committee not having put this on the statute. However. It's not my decision to make. You know, this the decision will be taken by the entire committee and we will be guided, obviously, by stakeholders because that's important. We need to hear those those views. You talked about the DAPOs and the DAPNs and that low uptake in relation to non-models and I, I, it was one of the first things I raised because it was a massive concern for me. It's not used and protection of victims is, is vital. And again, not putting this in the books removes that too. Although we've been told it's going to be brought forward in the miscellaneous again, I, I'm concerned if we push this back, are we pushing the miscellaneous provisions bill back? We have a really good opportunity in this committee to deliver on so much different pieces of legislation, to do what we're supposed to do in this place, which I don't think we've done anywhere near enough of, and nobody knows that better than yourselves. But all of the victims out there and all of the, all the victim sector that, that we certainly have not delivered anywhere near the amount of legislation that we should have and could have. But we are trying now as a committee to deliver legislation that's going to make a real difference to victims. In the, in the miscellaneous provisions, there's quite a bit of stuff around Gillam, which I also think is, is going to be massively important for this, for this sector, for domestic violence and obviously sexual violence of a wider nature. But 
So I'm just, I suppose I'm flagging that up. I am looking for a steer here from you. So I suppose the two things are a steer in relation to that. And then some kind of examples around that where the applicants would, because I'm very clear around the response, very clear around that. Mm -hmm. I, I absolutely think respondents need to have access because that those are most of the cases that I've had to deal with. I can't recall a case where I've had somebody who's a victim of domestic abuse who was the applicant, but I'm not dealing with anywhere near the amount of cases that you're dealing with. So you, you, you're more likely, obviously, to have examples around that. So it, it would be helpful to me to, to have an understanding of that, Sonia, if I... Okay, well, I think, first of all, in relation to the mandate, that is a real concern for us. But on the other hand, in relation to this never happening and never coming back again, you know, um, so we would be looking at it from the other um, viewpoint. So, and I suppose it really is listening to yourselves today. It's as long as a piece of string here at the moment. Nobody knows and we don't have those answers, you know, with regard to, um, as you're saying, the delay, you know, Nobody knows But if nothing long. happens, that's my concern. You know, mm -hmm. it, it's one thing for one part of this, you know, and, and it's a very important part not to happen. But if this whole entire uh, domestic abuse bill does not happen, and, that, and that's, I'm not saying that that's going to happen, and I'd be lying to you to say that, but what if it happened, you know, and, and whilst I get we want this right, we want it perfect, and I would much prefer that, it, that that's the way it was. But I don't think any piece of legislation will ever be perfect and we'll always be coming back to it and that's what we should be doing. I, I'm, I'm concerned that, are we prepared to say that we'd have none of it rather than have it without this? Is, is well, that where you're at? Well, we currently have a bill with no money attached to it anyway. Um, that's a huge concern in relation to the rollout of this. If we look at um, the police and we look at um, even social services and the, the court officers within the court, the amount of training um, that will need to happen to make this be a really good working piece of legislation for all victims. Um, we've no indication that any of that's going to come forward. And that's really, really concerning. Because if when this you bill is passed, sorry, apologies for cutting across you, Sonia. If this bill is passed, actually, we have put on the face of the bill around training and it's mandatory. It has to happen. So that is in the bill. There's no suggestion of any amendment to that. That's there. Mm -hmm. The training well, has to happen. The PSNA depends. have given a commitment. You know, they've said it will take a year. I don't know if it'll take the full year. But I would, and I, and I said this in the committee before, if it takes nine months to a year, as long as it's right, it absolutely has to be right. I agree with you. The training is vital and you know, you've outlined that before and I think you're 100 percent right the training the legislative yeah, there's a commitment for PSNI um, probation and court service then I think within the bill but if you yeah. look at um, this in relation to the family courts it's a whole piece around social services and social workers you know and there's no money um, or provision there in relation to that so th that's a concern it also, if you look at PSNI, if you look at the investment that other police services in other parts of the UK have put into training over the last number of years, it's been um, very substantial, mm -hmm. where our PSNI have not done that. Um, you know, and, um, and you will well know that, Linda, we've spoken about that before. Yeah. And um, so, again, it's about that underinvestment in services that there just seems to be a real pattern of here um, in Northern Ireland. In relation to the delay, um, I, I really would welcome the answers to you know the the research piece that the minister and the department are going to go back, you know, with, and then come back to that further consideration stage at the start of the year with those answers, you know, because this only came up last night. I saw it for the first time in a tweet, you know, and did start to look into research around this case in England and Wales and what was this and what was this about. So really, it's difficult to get your head around it when you've only been presented with it, you know, as well. And looking at um, all of the um, intricacies of it, which it seems very, very complex and it seems a what if. And from my understanding of listening in next door, it could be any case that could be brought up that you, you know, that could be challenged here. So um, my understanding is probably limited um, in relation to that. But, 
you know, from speaking to women last night about this, and um, legal aid is so contentious, and it is already being abused, as I've said previously, by so many perpetrators already. Um, I would love the Legal Services Commission to go off and look at, um, you know, 20 cases and actually look at some of these women, actually, that we're dealing with, and look at those perpetrators and see what their legal aid fees are and what they all add up to. You know, because that's what we're dealing with here at the moment. You know, um, it's a system that is already subject to abuse. You know, at the moment, and if anything, it is really, really good that this has highlighted it, and the committee has brought it to um, the fore. You know, for public awareness uh, um, around all of those um, issues. In relation to the applicants, we would be in support of both applicant and respondent because um, for one of the cases here, for example, um, a woman was brought to court um, for prohibited steps. She was seen as a flight risk. Um, the partner was in prison at the time. Um, the solicitor went to three different courts and got the prohibited steps order in the third court um, where he wasn't known to them and in full receipt of legal aid. And it was all based on her going to um, college at night to learn another language that he thought she was going to move to that country. So she had to make an application to the court in relation to appealing that, you know. So there are um, cases, you know, mm -hmm. and I think if you look at the bill, it does narrow it down. And, and I suppose that's what the department are trying to do. Uh, obviously, in, in order to um, reduce money and to um, reduce costs, but um, we would like to see it as wide as possible. I think the eligibility criteria is something then that needs, you know, more discussion to with regard to that. I know they're they're working on on that too. I um, say that they will limit the eligibility yeah. criteria. The, that's why I wanted to get that clear and, and on the record to know where we were sitting at that because obviously mm -hmm. we can only make decisions based on information oh, and we want to absolutely say that we'll limit the eligibility criteria if you put in for respondents and applicants mm -hmm. where would you sit on that uh, that the eligibility criteria should be and i know that's not an easy answer because no i don't want i want the eligibility mm -hmm. criteria widened out and i want applicants and respondents but we're not going to get both there's no point <laughs> that's what was i think clear from here where would you well, what would your advice be around that? It seems to be this choice that you just have to pick one or another, you know, and um, I don't want to be put in that position because I need to have the voice, you know, the voice of victims are in my head and I need to have them front and centre in this room today, you know, and I know that women will be both applicants and respondents in cases, you know, and we're narrowing that down. And I know, you know, the conversation with regard to that eligibility and those who have only got a prosecution. And if we look at our attrition rates here in Northern Ireland, they're so low. And that really would reduce the number of people coming through as well. I, I'm not asking you to, because I, yeah, I absolutely yeah. accept you have you speaking for everybody, and so and so you should. But can you just maybe give me which is which is the greater risk? Which is the greater risk? So if you narrow the eligibility criteria so much, that well, it'd be a higher percentage of respondents if we look at cases going through, and if you look at um, statistically, you know, it would be higher numbers. No, thank you. Appreciate, yeah, no, I absolutely appreciate you giving, giving those answers. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Thanks a million. Um, Sinead Bradley. Thank you, Chair. I hope you can hear me. I think it's coming up that the network's unstable, so hopefully you hear me okay. Um, Sonia, I want to thank you, and I want to thank you for not just being here today in the midst of our dilemma, but for everything you've brought to committee. You've been most helpful um, in terms of the resource you've brought and I think it's a little bit unfair, um, perhaps, to bring you here because, you know, we have engaged with a lot of stakeholders and it was impossible to get back to everybody inside this window. So, um, you know, we don't expect you to speak for all organisations, but we appreciate you being here for those people you do represent. In terms of then the dilemma, um, you know, I, I won't get into the piece about the amendments um, because I mean, I've been, reason for where I am and that and I suppose we have time. But in terms of the dilemma that we're that the committee faced today, um and you mentioned about that the people, the victims or survivors of abuse you spoke to were happy to go with uh to wait on this. And I just wondered um leaning on on Linda's point because I think it is really important. And to be fair, 
the, I suppose the conversation you would have had last night with those people would be different to the one you've had today because the minister has been and spoken and we've heard more information in that time. But were those um, victims or survivors, when they were saying they were willing to wait, do you think they realised that this wait could actually be extensive? So therefore, the wait would mean us not creating an offence that is domestic abuse and waiting for what could be a considerable period of time to then still have to, I suppose, deal with the legal aid issues because that re repercussive thing has been flagged up. You know, it, it doesn't go away. We've seen it, we've heard it. It doesn't go away and it will have to be dealt with. Or was it their opinion that perhaps that wait would be a shorter wait and therefore it's you know worth getting it all across the line at the same time and that the delay wouldn't be that significant in terms of there not being a domestic abuse offence for that period? Because when I retrace my steps through this bill, of course, the, the substantive piece is there will be an offence that is domestic abuse. And there were plenty of things that we wanted on this. And one of them for me was legal aid. And I'm quite um, pleased to see that it's on there. But I did take comfort from not just the minister's commitment or saying, you know, her intention, but also, Sonia, from the fact that I actually sought advice in it. The minister has a legal duty to commence. We're only talking about linking the timing of the commencement, but the minister does have a legal duty under the commencement part of the bill to commence with this. And I just wanted to know then on, on that basis, do you feel that people that you're represented would have been aware that the delay could be prolonged and that the risk of that would be there would not be an offence of domestic abuse in that time. Well, I suppose in Northern Ireland we're used to waiting, and um, especially in relation to um, domestic violence. Um, you know, um, we've waited so long for this. I think that is, um, you know, that was the conversations I had last night that um, we've waited long enough. Obviously, we didn't know what timelines, I don't know what timelines are. None of you know what the timeline is today either. Um, with regard to this, and ultimately, um, it's all of you know. It's your decision here as part of the justice committee to um, be making those decisions. It's not um, myself. I'm just putting a, a position out there after conversations with um, our members and also um, some of the women who would have given um, testimony to the justice committee as well. So, in relation to um, the weight. Um, you know, it's just sort of exhausting, the whole thing, to be honest. You know, we um, um, we seem to be the last part of um, the UK and Ireland to get an awful lot of things. And um, we're, we're sort of used to that, as I have um, said. But, you know, we don't know what the, the delays are going to be. And I, I feel it sort of put me in an unfair position, actually, to, to sort of try and answer that on behalf of people and what their what their answer to me today would be, given what the minister has stated in the last hour, because I don't know that, you know. Yeah. I, I don't know that, and I don't feel I can speak on, on behalf of, you know, of um, everyone in relation to that. Sorry, Sinead. No, I appreciate that, Sonia. I think that is the dilemma here. Um, that there isn't really the window of time to to conduct. And, and we do have to ask ourselves the question, the substantive bill um, being brought forward and the case of domestic abuse actually being an offence. In, in my way, that lifts a lot of the weight off our energies and efforts. And then we do look at the possibility we can hold the minister to account. We can drill down into all of the detail here. We can really focus on 27A, which looks to go even further and really creates a best book um, package of care around those victims. The conversation moves on very quickly to that um, more lucrative piece that really is about victims and helping them. 
And, and I understand that that's quite complex and it's a lot to throw out in such a short window. Um, but I suppose just, just to make you aware in terms of the committee's deliberations, that's what has been presented to us at this stage. Um, and I suppose it just keeps you informed on, on where we are as much as anything, because it, it is unfair. But Sonia, I appreciate you being here. Thank you. Discussion whenever it's on in here, I have my own views because this court judgment by the House of Lords ruling, uh, I have to say, I am not comfortable at all leaving the action to action, to call upon a minister to action that would require a judicial review to be taken, that the department has not actioned something based upon that court ruling. So we can have a discussion around what the minister said and how much credence members wish to give to that once the committee deliberates on it. I have, I have a number of views as to some of the arguments that the Minister has presented in respect of that issue. I know of other Ministers who were under a, a, a duty to implement the will of the Assembly, and they never did, and they got legal advice, and they didn't have to, and they therefore didn't commence it. So it is a moral duty, in my view, more than a legal duty that's actually actionable. But I don't think it's fair. I'm not going to drag Sonia into my interpretation of all of this. Uh, I want to bring in Rachel Woods. Thanks, Chair. Um, thank you, Sonia, for coming up. And um, I want to thank you for your engagement um, so far, and especially this last uh, couple of months. Um, I Sorry I missed the start of this. I was in question time, so I'm not too sure if my questions have already been asked, so I do apologise. But I wanted to just, because um, I'm not going to ask you about anything that was discussed today with regards to the Minister, because that is a decision for us to take, and that's not anything to do um, with, with, with you to, to, to say either way. That's, I'd be putting you in a very, very unfair position. Um, but in terms of, I don't know, do you, please interrupt me if this has already been asked, is about the um, eligibility waiver that the, uh, or the eligibility criteria that is in the Minister's Amendment, um, which is drafted at 27, and uh, they're putting a duty on themselves to create an eligibility criteria to assess victims um, or alleged victims of domestic abuse. Um, is that something that you would be willing to engage with the department on? And it also brings some expertise in of how potentially um, a perpetrators who allege to be victims could be, sorry, it's a crude term, could be weeded out. Because this is what the concern was um, put in to the um, press release last night that the current amendment is the scope then for others, um, including news who perpetrated the violence to get legal aid, which actually that's not in there because perpetrators can get legal aid if they meet the criteria for legal aid under financial eligibility. This is not what this amendment does or any of the other three that I've brought, indeed one with Sinead Bradley um, on top of the ministers. So it was just if the eligibility criteria um, could, could you help with that in terms of, of, of your experience with women's aid? Because that's where I see the fundamental problems that are being brought to us by the department being addressed is within the department's own amendment. Well, I, th I think we need a full review of legal aid because, as I've already said on several occasions um, this afternoon, the system is already being abused and used by perpetrators of domestic violence, you know. Um, so the risk of this... Um, causing more cost and, and uh, more perpetrators using it. Of course they are, because, uh, but you know, we would call for a full review. I know the Minister's talking about a policy review in relation to legal aid, but you know, if we're going to meet in the middle anywhere here, you know, can the Department look at a review of legal aid and um, wherever that sits? Um, because you know, it's, it's just not fit for purpose at the moment. It really, really isn't. Um, in relation to the eligibility criteria, we have looked at that and, and looked at, you know, MAREX and different things, you know, in relation to how that would sit for eligibility and, and trying to, to, but then that doesn't cover everyone because not everybody, you know, so it's that high risk. It's, it's a very difficult one, but of course we would be willing to um, engage um, in relation to, to looking at that. Well, thank you, um, and I do appreciate that. And I, I get that the eligibility criteria is not a, and it's not the perfect answer. You're always going to get people who fall outside of dealing with um, 
dealing with you know org sector organisations or support services or they don't go to their GP um, and obviously part of this bill is to encourage people to reach out and mm -hmm. it's a criminalisation of offence and, and, and deal and, and be involved in the in the justice system if that's what they need to do but also not be in in damaging relationships and abusive relationships as well and we've got, we know we have a lot of wider work to do but I I, I I see, and, and, and in bringing the amendments that I have brought to the ministers, is that that is where the department can weed out the abuse as a first step for this, and then a wider in it within 27A, which is a review in a couple of years' time. So I, I and I appreciate that you've said that you would be willing to engage, of course, and, and ab absolutely crucial um, for for you to do so, given the given the vast experience that you have. Um, but I'm, yeah, I'm not going to go on any longer, Chair, because I think um, everything that we covered was covered today within the, with the Minister. And thank you, Sonia, for being here. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. All free. Thanks, Chair. Uh, Sonia, thank you for all your work over the last number of years. Uh, feels like decades, uh, I suppose. Uh, one thing, <laughs> just one thing on Sonia's point, and I, I, if you read the commencement orders, the provision, the other provisions of this Act come into operation on such day or days as the Department of Justice may by order appoint. That's the only real leverage that they have, and there's no leverage there because the Department of Justice orders and appoints the day and hour that they bring any commencement in other than the, the section contained within con commencement on section 39. But so I would have real concerns because right through this process it was quite clear that the Department and the Minister did not want to touch legal aid in this bill. They just did not want to go there. And that played out in the House and I get that and that's, that's okay for the Minister to have that opinion. She has gave commitments today but she has came here with information to us with no proof and no evidence and I have asked for that evidence with regards to the domestic uh, the Department of Finance and the questions that they posed. Just to give you some concept of cost, because your big issue is cost and then roll out in time, and for us it's time. But what the department has said is that, and this all comes with a health warning, the current clause as it sits, I mean, inserted by Rachel, will cost 14 million. Now that's good news, because as far as I'm concerned, that's 14 million that are now in, is now going to be in the hands of victims. If the, claw, if the amendment that the department brings forward, which really does restrict that clause greatly, the department has said that bill, or that burden reduces to 12 million. Sorry, half a million, sorry, half a million. So you can see a massive difference between clause 27 as it sits now, with a burden of 14 million, and then they amend it laws if the department gets its way of half a minute. I couldn't, couldn't read, me, read me on right in there. So you can see the difference here and you see the difference that will have an impact that will have on the ground. So I'm not sure that the government's amendment, the department's amendment does it, cuts it at all uh, as to what we have achieved. Make no mistake about it, I agree with you when you say about legal aid. You can look at every single clause in this bill. The massive reaction that I received after consideration stage was all about civil legal aid. It was all about that issue about abuse in court. No, nothing else, no other issue. Yeah. Not about the child aggravator, not about the offence itself, not about coercive control, um, not about parent in the alienation. It was about the court case and abuse within and about actually doing something on legal aid, civil legal aid. Uh, about balancing that playing field. So this is a massive issue for victims out there. I'm with you there, and enough knowledge to know that, that is the case. So that's the burden. But the Minister also gave us a figure of four hundred million to our block grant grant through to an issue whereby if we have a different system here in England Wales, someone may well take a case in England or Wales uh, on on civil uh, rights grounds or equality grounds that because we have a better system here, they, they, they are being uh, dealt a bad hand. That's what the Minister is saying. Uh, so my question to you, Sonia, is have you any sort of idea of any reports out there that give you an aspect of the differences between Article 8, Article 8, Court 
proceedings in this jurisdiction compared to England and Wales with regards to differential? Because whilst the minister can say someone can take someone can take some some other jurisdiction to court because we have a system, this is about Article Eight. This is about uh, victims of domestic violence going through uh, Article Eight proceedings. So to me, that's a very very neat definition, a very neat string of people. It's, it's not a big wide thing. So I suppose the question is, do you have any idea, concept uh, of, of the differentials between our legal aid system on those issues and England's? We were actually in the office trying to do research on this this morning and we're ringing you know, um, our other partners in England and um, Wales and we couldn't get any anything. You know, So certainly we're happy to, when we get that information, bring it back to the committee as soon as we can. Yeah. Um, but we did try and, and get that this morning, but you know, we couldn't get... And looking at um, equivalents of bills and what money was attached to them and that kind of thing was the information we were looking at this morning. But hopefully, you know, by the end of the week we'll have um, a little bit more information on that, so we're happy to report back to the committee with that. So sorry, yeah. Paul, I don't... No, 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 end of week, but well, that's quite impressive if you are able to do oh, that. Oh, yeah, we're impressive. We'll get it. <laughs> <laughs> so you're, you're, you're more yeah, impressive yeah. than the, the Minister yeah. in that regard with regards to timings. So then that puts me on to my next yeah. question, which is this. The Minister says that she should, have hear, she should hear back from legal counsel within weeks with advice. She said before the end of this year. So that's weeks. Uh, or certainly before Christmas, I think she, I'm quoted here as her saying. But she could not give us a time. And this is the point that Linda makes. She could not give us the uh, committee a time when she will have assessed that advice. And this is where along as a piece of string issue comes into this. Uh, now, what I'd be interested in knowing, because she did raise this as an example, I would like to know, if the committee can do so, uh, how long it took the Health Minister to do due diligence on the nurses' pay issue. Um, because I'm sure that was done in weeks or months. Now, if we're talking about a series of months, two months, three months, well, then I think that's, yeah. that that's the duration of time that we are able to afford mm -hmm. the Minister. If it's six months, nine months, a year, then I think that's a completely yeah. different scenario. Absolutely. You would be happy, you'd be content with that time scale? Um, yeah, I suppose, you know, last night we were thinking that it wasn't going to be major, you know, delays, and obviously today has changed that. Um, so, yes, they would be um, reasonable. Right, OK. Uh, also, too, uh, we did probe the Minister on amending the amendment, which is the one that she has taken so much offence on, which is the commencement of Clause uh, 37. I have enough experience in this place to know that when Ministers want to or don't have a will to enact a bill or a piece of legislation within a bill, they, can, they will ignore it. And I've seen that myself with the Child Protection Disclosure Scheme. Uh, I've also seen how organisations will ignore and, and, and methodise it to death uh, and pilot it to death. So it does happen out there, there's no doubt about it. Uh, so I, I would worry that if we don't have some sort of commencement, you and I could be sitting in a room in a number of years' time or even a decade's time discussing the same thing about the, or frustrations with nothing being done with legal, civil legal aid. So I have real concerns that the minister would take so offence, so much offence to a commencement order, uh, without and, and she can amend this amendment if she so f wishes, but she has clearly stated today that she she has no intention of trying to, in her words, I'm sure, correct amendment 15. She just does not want it anywhere near the face of the bill. End of. Uh, and I'm aggrieved by that. Uh, especially when she comes here telling us there's a problem, but she won't provide any evidence whatsoever. Um, if, if, a mem if there was a commencement order put in place on the bill that set a time frame, which would allow and afford the Minister time to assess the legal counsel that she's going to get this year, is that something that, that, the, that your organisation would be content with so that that would allow the rest of the bill to carry on and the offence of domestic violence come in and at a later stage then clause 37 is enacted whereby, and again there could, it might not be just a condition of time, 
it might be a conditionality around the Barnet consequentials. So if it comes back, if the legal advice comes back and says, yeah, Minister, you were right to hold off because if you do this, the risk is that you will be liable to, that the, the, the jurisdiction will be liable to a £400, pound, £400 million pound, uh, Barnet consequential then she would be right to hold off. Now, I, I, don't, I don't see any evidence that that is the figure. And I don't know how the minister has derived from that other than she's multiplied the population percentage, Northern Ireland compared to England, Wales. That's, that's it, basically. So, jury's still out in my eyes. Uh, but would, would, would a commencement order in that vein where you have a time um, limit on it to give the minister, afford the minister time to assess and also a conditionality around if this is really bad, as you thought, Minister, then you can cease. Is, is that something that you would contemplate supporting or at least...? Yeah, it is something we would um, consider, but um, I thought listening to the Minister earlier that she wasn't willing oh. to move in and that that's direction. Yeah, so that's, to be fair to her, yeah. she, she is not going there at all. So, but that's not to stop individual MLAs or even this committee from forming an opinion to amend an amendment or, or to put in a new fresh amendment because now with her not moving, with the Minister not moving the bill, we can now put in new amendments, fresh amendments. Uh, and I'm just wondering if, if that's something that you, you would consider acceptable in try, trying to move this forward, get the rest of the bill commenced, but also have this commitment of a commencement in a conditional sense, on the face of the bill. Yeah. 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 Okay, Chair, thank you. Gordon? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Sonia, for your information today. Anyway, just a quick point. You talked about uh, perpetrators getting legal aid, and obviously um, they, they meet the criteria as it, as it exists, or in some form they meet the criteria. Uh, I would assume in a lot of cases they were the main income earner in the household. Uh, and the, and the, uh, the female partner, for example, um, they perhaps were less were on a lesser income. I'm making an assumption, but just for an example, mm -hmm. they lesser income, and therefore you would have felt that they should have got it and were unable to get access to it. While he was, he did get access, and yet he there was clear evidence that he, he was well, much greater income. Would that be right? Not um, well, I suppose, um, and I've made reference to it, I suppose, um, and Linda, you've talked about the working poor, you know, the, a lot yes. of the women that we're dealing with that would be on a minimum wage. So if you're on 16 hours minimum wage even, um, you still wouldn't be entitled to, to legal aid, you know, with regard mm -hmm. to the current, um, you know, threshold. Um, many of these um, men weren't working. You they know, weren't working. Weren't working, or yeah. leave their jobs. In mm -hmm. fact, in order to um, access, not have to pay child maintenance. You know, may have to pay the mm -hmm. the minimum of three. Um, I think it's three fifty a week. You know, um, in relation to that, so it's a win win really for them. So there are um, clear loopholes there that they are able to get. Oh to yeah, there there really really is. So even if they are a known perpetrator, as Rachel has said, if they meet that threshold, it doesn't matter. They're still eligible. You know. And we have people who have got legal aid from prison, you know. So that's the reality, you know. In one of the the cases we have there, um, he was in prison. That was the prohibited steps example, and he got that from prison. So, you know, that's what we're dealing with here. If you take all the perpetrators out, let's just not give them legal aid at all anymore, and then give it to all the victims who need it. That's it all sorted. I would agree <laughs> with know, that, but, but if only, you know, if only. Right, yeah, great. Thanks very much. Thanks, Chair. It would be nice to change the balance. It's just on that because point they Rachel. wanted to come in. Sorry. Um, I, I'm okay for Paul to come in. Either, it's just want. on a wee quick issue. Yeah. Rachel raised it earlier. So, when you talk about the respondent piece, and it hasn't been dialogued here in this session, but if 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 that scenario where the the the, the person is in prison getting legal aid and and the, the victim is, is having to drain resources. So even if they are, even if, they're, even if they lose and then they take a bail, they become then the applicant, and they would have to pay for that. Then, and that's 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 one of the issues around the respondent piece that we need to be careful of too. 
uh, just on that. So just and that's the case in the lower courts as well for that provision around the appeal to and um, a lot of cases, um, domestic violence cases would escalate too. So that's just another point. Um, Just quickly on the back of that point, I suppose just to be clear, it's not a case of that I don't want applicants no. to be able to oh. get the legal aid because I want everybody, I agree with you, shouldn't be given to the perpetrator. <laughs> yeah. um, and if only we get to that point, that's why I keep saying for me 27A, well I understand, gives no commitments, I actually think it's more important because I want to see something much wider. I don't think that, that this goes anywhere near far enough in, in looking after people and that's my big concern. And that's our job as a, a committee and future committees, which I'll be a member of, but we'll see, um, to, to ensure that that happens. There, there is a bigger piece of work, on you, as, you, as you've already outlined. And I think that that's... Um, and that's a concern too for us because as a committee you're all working so well and so victim focused and you know we are coming, time is ticking away with regard to the end of the mandate and nobody can say that you're all going to be here as part of, of this committee and have that real commitment. I suppose I want to, I want to just pick up on the, the point that Paul made around the, the commencement stuff and that is to go back to the, the issue of certainly we could amend the commencement but the minister can still not bring the bill forward and we're still back then to that position or can go ahead of the commencement tied and not commence anything. So I, I'm, I'm still in that place where I, I'm, I find it really difficult. I think that is a conversation for us to have. Yeah, sure. I, I think you're right. We have put questions to you that are unfair. But to be honest, it's because we're trying to get to the right place for the victims. And, the, and that's, the, that's the truth of why we're, yeah. we're asking. But, but you're dead right. It is unfair to put you in that position. And we as legislators will have to make the final decision. Mm -hmm. And I hope, for the sake of the victims, that whatever whatever position we come to is the right one. But I can give you this guarantee, from certainly from my point of view, but from my party's point of view, this is not the end point. You're right. The review of legal aid as a whole has to be, has to be done. There has to be. And it's not about saving money. Because I truly and genuinely believe in the long term you will save money when you do the right thing for victims. You'll save it somewhere. And that, that's the bottom line. And you will save money if you do a proper review, which actually looks at who you're giving yeah. legal aid to and how you assess eligibility criteria. So there's, there is bigger things, and we will certainly be engaging with you further as a committee. But I did just want to thank you for coming here at such short notice, for helping us to, to try and bottom out some of this stuff and to, and to hopefully get to a good a good place and a good decision for victims and whatever it is I can guarantee and, and you've said it yourself this committee has worked well together and we've worked well together because we care about the issue yeah. so I can guarantee you whatever place we get to it's with as all of the, everything that has been done to date it's with the right intention it's absolutely with the, the intention of doing the right thing for the victims so just and, and again thanks for million for coming it's such a really really do appreciate it Rachel, and then we'll, I'm going to let Sonia go so the committee can deliberate further. It was just a point of clarity with regard to what Paul had said with regard to the respondents. It is in, inherently tied then to the other amendment of the lower, removing the lower courts because appeals are heard at the higher courts regardless if it's a family care centre or the actual higher courts. The appeals are not heard at the magistrates courts or the rep lower so they're all inherently tied which is why it is for me, very important that it's not just respondents because you're, you can't take an appeal then without being financially driven. So that it's just a point of clarity on that. They're, they're all interconnected um, with regard to the three amendments that are in my name. Okay. Sonia, can I thank you? Um, because I know um, I asked you to come here and I take full responsibility. Mm -hmm. For that, it was my decision, and I know there'll be other groups that will say, "Why was it when we women's aid and others?" Again, I take responsibility for that, and that's a, something that the chairman has at his discretion. It was made for the right reasons and given the timeliness of it. So, Sonia, you, you have responded to that call to the committee because you have played a very important role, and the evidence provided to the committee. That's not to diminish at all what other organisations have provided to us, but I take on that responsibility. If there's any criticism to come 
uh, to the committee's way. That's that's for me to deal with. But thank you, Sonia. I really you. appreciate it. Okay. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Good luck with your deliberations. Thank you. Okay, members, we're, we're going to go into closed session in order for Stephanie, who I've asked to come um, and speak to the committee in terms of the Amendment 15 that has been put forward by the committee to get some advice. And then we'll go back into public session um, to finalise a position on it. So we'll go into closed session. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room. Okay, members, thank you for... Uh, persevering in terms of uh, how the committee has been seeking to address this issue. Uh, after uh, prolonged conversation uh, and considering all of these issues, um, there is a proposal that the committee had considered in closed session, but I want to, for the record, uh, have it dealt with in public session. Uh, that was to withdraw the uh, committee amendment, uh, Amendment 15, uh, which ties the commencement provisions of Clause 27 that relates to legal aid uh, to the commencement of uh, Chapters 1 and 2 uh, of the Domestic Abuse and Families Proceedings Bill. Uh, in withdrawing that amendment, uh, the committee amendment is to then put forward a new amendment, uh, which would be to enact Clause 27 uh, 12 months after uh, Royal Assent has been granted to this bill. In doing so, that decouples the issue uh, of creating these offences. Those offences would now be uh, created, and Clause 27 then would be dealt with 12 months uh, after uh, receiving royal assent. Uh, those members in favour of that approach, uh, please vote accordingly. Okay, so that's Sinead Bradley, Gordon Dunn, Paul Frew. Rachel Woods and myself, Paul Given. Those against was Linda Dillon, Doug Beatty, uh, Emma and Gemma. Okay. Just for the record, Chair, obviously, I mean, it's, it's not that we're against bringing this into to be, and we certainly want to see it happening, but in the absence of having a conversation based on that amendment with the Department to know what the, the knock-on effect of it might be, in terms of delay to the actual bill, I'm not content at this point to support it, and and that's really what it, what it boils down to is the delay in, in delivering this um, abuse offence, and I would have concerns that this could potentially delay it. After having a conversation with the department, obviously, if if there aren't going to be negative impacts in terms of delay, then we we could potentially support. But at this point, yeah. okay, well. For, for my party's perspective, um, the issue that had been presented was that this had the potential of delaying the introduction of the coercive control offence, and that's not something that I want to do. Uh, but I also want to have Clause 27 brought forward. The Minister has outlined uh, what she regards as very significant repercussive consequences um, that they need to carry out due diligence, uh, and therefore should. Uh, due diligence uh, materialise uh, to the scale of which the Minister presented, uh, of course uh, my party would be willing to uh, repeal this particular uh, provision um, because that kind of repercussive impact is not something that I would uh, feel able to support. Uh, however, I, I am very much aware uh, that victims of domestic abuse have waited many years um, to have this kind of provision put in place. Uh, I've heard the evidence that was brought forward um, during the, the course of the consideration process by this committee. I've heard that evidence again, again today, and I believe that this is meeting the Minister halfway. It's a compromise in terms of my position as to where I am on it, uh, and I hope that the Minister will recognise that for what it is and will now proceed with bringing forward the further consideration stage uh, next week to allow this pr to be progressed. Any other members? Sinead Bradley. Thank you, Chair. Chair, yes, in supporting this, I also uh, want to acknowledge the very real concerns that the Minister did bring to the committee that were flagged up with her on Friday about the repercussive uh, consequences and effect that could happen. And to be fair to the Minister and the Department officials today, I think they were trying to be as open and honest about this as they could be, but they could only bring the word could to us because they haven't explored this fully. 
So I think this is a fair compromise in that it allows the offence, which we all agree, we all want um, to, to go ahead as quickly as possible. It allows us to proceed with that, but it also creates a window of opportunity for the minister and the department to explore the reality behind um, those concerns and to, to bring some real um, detail on what is real and, and what may not be. Then um, we also discuss, and it is important to note, um, that the minister, having highlighted those concerns to us, um, was understandably um, eager that we understood them. And we did. And I would also then say that the fact that she may come back to us and present to us within that 12 months, at any stage in that 12 months, a factual, uh, her findings that could actually spell out that, yes, this is the worst case scenario that we anticipated. And in that case, I can assure the minister um, that the SDLP would not be content in forcing ahead um, with anything that would have such a significant impact on the block grant or would have an effect across the executive. And on that basis, um, we would work quickly with the department to do any revoking um, of any piece of legislation that would have that effect. But in the absence of us not having any information to actually say that that is the case, I think it's important that this position does allow the bill to proceed and the offence to be created and the decoupling effect that the Minister has asked for can be achieved here. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you, Sinead. Rachel Wood. Thank you, Chair. Um, and I appreciate all the efforts made today by the Minister and Permanent Secretary and yourself as well as for calling this meeting and for attending today and also for the Minister and her staff for engaging with me in the last couple of days or last day or so. I do think we are reaching some middle ground here and I think that this is a reflection of the reviews that have been expressed to us um, as a committee, but also outside by victims of domestic abuse, have the experience of being, uh, be, being within the court setting and also being a victim of domestic abuse. So I, am, I, do, I didn't accept the, the, the cost implications that were issued earlier on as a valid reason not to approve legal aid provisions. Um, it's a waiver of financial eligibility limits, as I said before, for victims. So it shouldn't be forgotten, but I, I do not believe that the Northern Ireland Block Grant should be used for schemes in other jurisdictions at all. Um, it is completely unfair, so I am sympathetic to the concerns that have been raised by the Minister. Um, and I do think that this is, is somewhat of a middle ground and would absolutely hope the further consideration stage can be next week. Okay. Thank you, Rachel Woods. And can I thank members, because this has been a, a very serious issue, and I think members have ha handled it. Uh, with sensitivity and I believe we all have the same intent and objective that we want to achieve in supporting victims um, both in terms of legal aid and also when it comes to the provisions contained in this bill and I want to just put on record again my thanks to all members of the committee for the way in which that they have conducted themselves this afternoon. Okay members, so thank you. Meeting adjourned. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.